let's begin the meeting. Uh, good morning to uh, uh, my fellow commissioners on the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense uh, and to our uh, extraordinary staff uh, as well. And as always, uh, we want to express our support to the Hudson Institute in Washington, which uh, has given us a home and provided us with the administrative uh, support we knew to need to do our work. Um, I also want to uh, thank our uh, supporters, including particularly two uh, foundations, Open Philanthropy and the uh, Smith Richardson Foundation, without which we couldn't do what we're doing. So um, our objective today uh, is to provide the commission with a better understanding of emerging uh, biological infectious disease threats and the uh, innovative next generation technologies which can be used to protect us uh, from those threats. Uh, this commission was created in 2014. We issued our first report, big report in 2015, a national blueprint for uh, biodefense uh, in which we took a close look at uh, leadership, coordination, collaboration, and innovation. Uh, and we found bottom line that the country was unprepared for uh, an infectious disease outbreak, let alone a bioterrorist uh, attack. Obviously, uh, we meet today still in the midst of the infectious disease pandemic that we foresaw in our 2015 report I repeat, not because we were prophets or geniuses, but because all the experts that we talked to uh, told us that it was coming. So it's five years later, and because of what we are experiencing now, we know that uh, more than ever, that we, the country needs uh, strong centralized leadership of our biodefense enterprise. It just has not been there. We need efficient, effective coordination of federal biodefense uh, programs, and uh, we need mutually beneficial cooperation between the public and private sectors and non-governmental organizations to reduce uh, catastrophic biological risk and damage. Um, we also still need uh, more coordinated innovation, a sort of innovation that will help us solve difficult problems posed by biological threats and infectious disease outbreaks like COVID-19. In our previous uh, briefings, we have seen that science and technology, research and development are uh, double-edged swords. This is uh, not only the lesson of our time, but the lesson of history. They offer breakthroughs, offer both promise and, and peril. Uh, with the democrat democratization and in some ways the digitalization uh, of biological and other areas of science and technology, a, a, a new and serious threat landscape uh, has developed. And of course, nature also continues uh, to threaten us uh, in many ways that are facilitated by uh, modern transportation, modern communication, et cetera. Uh, science and technology, uh, has given us better lives, but can also be used against us in ways that are limited only by uh, evildoers' imagination. And today we're going to learn more about that uh, from uh, Dr. Jamie Asif of NTI, Dr. Sohini Ramachandran of Brown University, and Ms. Nita Mahatov, CEO of uh, Metabiota. Um, we know that science and technology can also provide solutions to uh, the biological threats we face, including infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, last July, that is July of 2019, uh, thinking about uh, how we could better uh, uh, bring government, uh, private sector, and academia together uh, to get ahead of the threats of infectious disease that we faced. We held a hearing in New York uh, on that subject. At that time, we, we called it a Manhattan Project for Biodefense. I think we were thinking particularly about uh, a goal, a, a kind of um, visionary goal of what the country could marshal its resources 
to create uh, platforms for uh, universal anti-influenza vaccines and anti-viral uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, obviously, uh, we were not able to do that in time for COVID-19. And right now, we're waiting for science and technology to produce the uh, vaccine that we need to stop COVID-19. And it's really quite remarkable that progress is being made as rapidly as it is being made. But still, if, if, a, if the kind of platform we have in mind for universal vaccines had been available, um, hopefully we would have had a vaccine by now. Uh, these uh, important life and death breakthroughs are not going to happen through business as usual. We need a big uh, new national project to solve this uh, really big life and death uh, national challenge. Um, I'm really excited to say today that the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense is launching a project to do uh, exactly that, to determine what would be necessary uh, to, uh, to actually uh, begin what we're calling an Apollo project for biodefense, an Apollo project to find a universal anti-flu, uh, antiviral vaccine platform. Uh, we're going to examine our nation's uh, track record with other successfully executed uh, grand projects like the Moonshot, the Apollo program. We're gonna look at how the nation is dealing with COVID-19 and has dealt with other outbreaks that are ongoing like uh, Ebola. We're gonna make some recommendations about where we need to go, what our objectives should be, and uh, how uh, we can get there. And we're only able to do this because of generous support from those two foundations, new support from those two foundations I mentioned at the outset of my remark, Open Philanthropy and the uh, Smith Richardson uh, Foundation. And we thank them uh, very much for that. And we'll work hard to vindicate their uh, confidence uh, in us. We've got a, a superb group of witnesses today that uh, not only uh, can help us uh, form uh, this Apollo project for biodefense and implement ideas, but will help us in updating our 2015 report. And members of Congress, there are leaders in business, uh, technology, and uh, academia. And as a group, they bring the, the critical ingredients that the country needs, um, which is leadership of vision. And I speak particularly of the two members of Congress who are going to be with us. Uh, and uh, a partnership uh, between the public and private sectors on uh, the development of uh, new uh, technologies uh, to deal with this challenge. So uh, I'm excited about the day. I thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Asha for uh, 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 bringing this all together uh, for us with her team. And I'm honored now to yield to my dear friend and the co-chair of the commission, uh, Governor Tom Ridge. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you. There's uh, not much more to be said uh, after that introductory statement. Uh, I think on behalf of the committee members, we want to thank you very much for your leadership. I'm glad you applauded Asha and her team. Uh, their work over the past five plus years has uh, the cumulative effect as a, as a infrastructure and a foundation upon which uh, policy makers in the aftermath of COVID-19 can look to the future and look to the recommendations and now particularly with this notion of this, the, the Apollo project to work in concert with both the public and the private sector to ensure that the predictable global pandemic and what we've learned unfortunately in this episode is that disease is now globalized just like transportation, finance and travel and that we will be far better prepared and frankly working with policymakers on both sides of the aisle. So I thank you for your strong statement and I remind uh, all of our friends who are participating today but all those who've given up their time and expertise 
for during the past five years to build this foundation. This, uh, this, it's more than a, a than a thirty thousand foot level overview. It is a structure. We have very specific structural changes that we would recommend based on the 2015 report and with the advent of the Apollo project and the additional input from others, we look to work with policymakers to make a difference. We'll never be able to prevent, pre preempt mother nature. Uh, there's a force stronger than all governments combined, but we can certainly learn from COVID-19 and build out a protocol, build out an, an internal structure within the federal government and collaboration with the private sector It'll certainly mitigate, mitigate and reduce uh, the personal as well as financial impact of future pandemics. And I wanna say this during uh, this political year, I am particularly gratified, honored and pleased to have been part of a strongly unequivocal, enthusiastic bipartisan approach to problem solving. Mm -hmm huge, huge uh, initiative we've undertaken, and it's only been through the collaboration of scientists and experts and political figures on both sides of the aisle that we can go to our policymakers and say, here's what we think, here's, wh here's what we've done, here's what we think, how can we work with you to make a difference? So uh, again, Senator, I want to thank you. It's been a real pleasure being associated with you, just not only in a personal way, but uh, in, in this initiative. I remember when you called and floated the idea about co-chairing with you. One, it was an honor to be, and flattering to be called, but I remember we both agreed, neither one of us wanted to be associated with just another report. And as valuable as they are, we've seen too many that have gathered dust on the shelves of think tanks and in congressional and Senate offices. We wanted to be part of a bipartisan group that worked very hard and was steadfast in their commitment to make a difference. Uh, the COVID-19 is a reminder that we still have a lot of work to do and it'll be a pleasure for me and to work with you and my other colleagues, bipartisan group, as we mentioned before, to see if we can mitigate the effects of what we know will be a future pandemic. So thank you for your strong statement. Thank you for your leadership and it's good to be with you and uh, our colleagues and uh, the panelists today. Thank you, Tom, for your strong statement and your uh, kind words. Uh, now to uh, Senator Tom Daschle. Well, thank you, Joe. I, I can't improve on your comments or those of Governor Ridge. You both have spoken eloquently, and uh, I uh, can only emphasize some of the things you've said. I, 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 we all have a lot to do, and there are a lot of things on our plates. But I think we all recognize how critically important this issue is and, and, uh, and, and what we have to do to elevate uh, around these issues as we look at public policy going forward. We know the facts. The facts are that pandemics have killed more people in the last hundred years than all the wars put together. It's created more economic devastation than any other thing we've ever had to experience. And we know that this COVID crisis is not going to go away anytime soon. We know that there's going to be another pandemic. And when that pandemic occurs, we know we have to be better prepared. And I think better prepared means having a better infrastructure. It means having greater priority around these issues. It means having, as Tom said so powerfully and eloquently just now, real bipartisan consensus on what that infrastructure and policy ought to look like. That's our role, and we're delighted to have uh, such prominent experts join us today to further enlighten us and give us greater greater thought on how we might proceed and what that policy ought to look like. Thanks, Tom. That was great. I appreciate everything you've contributed to our work. Congressman Jim Greenwood. As my fellow commissioners and the, and the commission staff know, I come to this issue from the perspective of the biopharmaceutical industry. I um, served as president and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization for 15 and a half years, from which I've just retired a couple of months ago, but I still remain committed to the industry. And I, what I think is important um, for us all to take uh, into consideration is that the, the, the policies and the, and the projects that we're considering uh, in terms of defending ourselves, not only from bioterror, but certainly from this pandemic, um, cannot be isolated or taken uh, uh, separately from the policies that are in the, uh, under consideration that apply to the entire biopharmaceutical 
uh, sector. We've seen uh, an, a, an extraordinary response uh, to this uh, pandemic from companies, little biotech companies that most people had never heard of, like Novavax and Moderna and Inovio and BioNTech, and from large pharmaceutical uh, companies that have household names like Pfizer and AstraZeneca, Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck. Um, and um, we are, the, the, the nation and the world are fortunate that we have the expertise and the investment uh, in those enterprises that um, are now working with the federal government to respond in what is really, really lightning speed uh, to develop therapeutics and vaccines. And so I, I'll, I'll probably address these issues when we have the two Congress uh, members um, before us, but um, it, we, it, we, uh, we've got to figure out how to make sure that uh, drugs of all kinds are affordable and accessible um, uh, without uh, undermining this extraordinary innovation, medical innovation system, where, you know, where we lead uh, the world in. And uh, I, with that, I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, uh, I'm experiencing something I never experienced in my years in the Senate. We're ahead of schedule. If you, I should want to say anything for a few minutes or uh, any of our ex officios do. Uh, well, I think I'll, I'll just reiterate a few comments and, and call Good. attention to one thing in particular. Um, we are right up on the anniversary of the anthrax events of 2001. Senator Daschle did not uh, mention them, but I, I will. I think the first uh, letters were mailed uh, tomorrow on September mm -hmm. 18th. And uh, while COVID is very, very important as a naturally occurring disease, as is pandemic influenza, and uh, accidental releases from laboratories are also a big concern. Uh, I don't think we can afford to forget uh, that bioterrorism and biological warfare, both of those are still very, very much part of the global landscape. Um, I, I also think that all of these things are interrelated. We believe that COVID-19 is a naturally occurring disease, but there are still questions about whether the the organism was being studied by that laboratory in Wuhan, whether, uh, so it started out as naturally occurring, but then was released accidentally or intentionally. We, we don't know, and we have to do a better job. I think when we're uh, looking at what it takes to create an Apollo program and what it takes to really um, take biological threats off the table, we're going to have to also go after the technology that answers these questions. So we know, we know what we're dealing with, we know what the sources are, and we know how to uh, counter proliferation of naturally occurring disease and an intentionally introduced disease. So I wanted to mention that. I also think that for our Apollo program, it's important to let everybody know that uh, obviously we, the commission, are not undertaking an Apollo program all by ourselves. Uh, as you mentioned, Senator Lieberman, it's going to take uh, a, a humongous public-private partnership. And I think we have to think about it, not just in terms of a singular moonshot, but as um, shots out throughout the, uh, maybe not just throughout our solar system, but perhaps throughout the galaxy, with different shots going in different places. Biodefense is such a complicated issue. Uh, and how we deal with disease and how it affects us, uh, those are complicated too. But I believe there are real solutions to be had uh, in terms of biotechnology and all the other technologies that we have uh, that we can bring together. We just need some good vision and to, for, for an organization like ours to put something down on paper and uh, get, it, get it moving. Um, so that's... Uh, that's what I would have to add while we're waiting. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I appreciate what you said. And it's really important uh, for us as well as everybody else as the, the, uh, our Apollo project becomes uh, better known. Obviously, we're not, we're not the ones to do the Apollo project, but I think we're trying to uh, see uh, whether we can formulate a national goal and uh, that meets a real national need and, and uh, Describe how, how uh, our country, uh, perhaps working with other countries in the world, certainly uh, public-private 
uh, academic partnership can achieve that goal. So I think, I don't know that it's quite right to say a blueprint, but, but that's the idea. And I, I agree with you. Uh, we're, 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 um, we're, we're trying to uh, open people's minds and create incentives to uh, uh, put us in better position on uh, the next time an infectious disease pandemic occurs, which as we all agree it will. So that, those are important comments, thank you. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I think it's interesting that uh, when we submitted that report in 2015, we took a leap and tried to calculate economic cost of, our, of a country's failure to protect itself against the pandemic. And I think, at least I will speak for myself, the notion that would be a trillion dollar impact was breathtaking in its scope. And we missed the target by a lot. That is, I mean, I, I like to think that uh, we were thought about it considerably and tried to gauge the impact and how grossly underestimate we grossly underestimated the impact of the pandemic. Uh, and it's a 200,000 lives and going, you know, I, I think about this. Uh, there are 58,000 names on the uh, wall, Vietnam veterans. That's several years of war, a lot of injuries. I think it was 400 plus thousand in World War II. That was several years of war. And we're halfway there in six months. Uh, it is, uh, it's breathtaking in its scope. And as visionary as this group was, and as committed as we were to making a difference, well, I don't think anyone ever imagined that we'd see a replication of the Spanish flu. I, I, I'm just so proud to be associated with this group. Just because of the vision, we're allowed to think that bad things can happen and allowed to prepare for them, particularly if there's some reason to be predictive about it. And uh, that's why our work uh, continues. I've loved the idea of the Apollo project, uh, Joe. You've been pushing that for the past couple of years. It's uh, very exciting to be part of this project. And I think we've been very careful and appropriately so to avoid, I told you so. It doesn't do anybody any good. Can't spend a lot of time yeah. in the rear view mirror. Won't do a damn thing to make sure that we mitigate. Not, I don't think we can prevent mother nature uh, from throwing at it again, but we certainly can mitigate the future circumstances. So it's a, a good time to be involved with my friends. I'm glad to, glad to be here. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, uh, you're right on target and obviously you with your background um, uh, have contributed a lot uh, to what we have, uh, what we've been able to do. I mean, the, the um, two, two reactions to what you've said. One is, we were in the 2015 report. We we were at one point. Some, somebody said it was like we were saying the British are coming. The British are coming. We were saying an infectious disease pandemic or a bioterrorist attack is coming, but it was hard to get anybody's attention. Of course, when the Brits were actually coming, now uh, we have experienced this horrendous pandemic, and hopefully, it will generate um, the kind of support for preventive and protective activity in the future. The second thing, just to, to emphasize from my perspective as a former senator, the impact of this in uh, 2009, when President Obama came into office, we were, uh, we had been into the 2008 uh, Great Recession for a period of months, and, and it was really bad. And President Obama came in with an economic recovery program that was by my recollection, about $940 billion. That was the largest federal program for one bill, I mean, apart from the budget, ever. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, to, get, to get the three Republican votes we needed in the Senate, uh, we reduced it to about $780 billion. I don't remember exactly. So now, uh, I think federal emergency response spending to the pandemic is over four trillion, and uh, it's hard to tell what will happen in the next couple of weeks. But it could well be another trillion and a half. It could be over five and a half trillion. Now, it, it's it, I think it was necessary, but it shows you the scope. 
uh, and I guess it also proves your point that um, uh, we were speculating about the cost of a pandemic. Unfortunately, we can tell you exactly what is being spent uh, without even trying to evaluate, of course, the loss of uh, what will inevitably be well over 200,000 lives. So here we are. Uh, and um, we're, I think you probably feel, and everybody does involved, that we're sort of honored and privileged to be in a position where we can try to do something about this. Hopefully we can. So, uh, so thanks for being with us um, uh, in really truly uh, a bipartisan fashion, which is the uh, spirit and the essence of our commission. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, introduce two members of Congress with us this morning, Congresswoman Susan Brooks, Republican of Indiana, and Congresswoman Diana DeGette, of, uh, a Democrat of Colorado. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, well, let me just say generally and quickly about the two of them. Uh, as we've said all along in our 2015 report, and again this morning, to, 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 to really um, respond to the threat of the bio threat, infectious disease and terrorism, uh, it takes vision and it takes leadership. And these two members of Congress have really uh, shown uh, both, that they understand the, 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 the potential catastrophic effects of, of large-scale biological uh, events like COVID-19. Congresswoman uh, Brooks uh, led the charge in Congress last year to reauthorize the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act uh, in which, uh, really, in large part through her leadership, uh, 14 uh, of the recommendations from our national blueprint for uh, biodefense uh, were included. Uh, I, I, I know, uh, Congressman Brooks, that you're, you're leaving Congress after this term. Uh, may I say, uh, on behalf of our commission, not only thank you for what you've done in the biodefense area, but we hope and trust that you are not retiring from that particular <laughs> battlefield. Uh, and um, because we really need your vision and leadership with that. And thanks for all you've done to serve um, your constituents in Indiana and uh, the entire country. I'm uh, honored to introduce you now to our commission. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and uh, thank you to all the members of the commission uh, and to those uh, watching on this Zoom call. Um, I'm not certain if my good friend and colleague, uh, Representative DeGette, is actually on yet. We are both in the middle of a communications technology uh, subcommittee hearing, so I've got uh, another screen going where we started that at 10 o'clock. Um, and you might be able to see behind, uh, I am in Washington, D.C., and votes um, are going to begin um, in the very near future. And so we may be tag teaming a bit um, because as you probably may or may not know, uh, we do votes uh, alphabetical order and um, only so many members on the chamber floor at a time, and then they take a break uh, for disinfecting, and then we go back for the second vote. So. Um, it's, a, it's a new world day. I wish we would go back to the old world. I certainly miss seeing my colleagues and seeing all of you in person. But uh, um, I, I'm really pleased to be a part of this and I wanna just thank you for the incredible work that you all did. Um, of course, I, I did work very closely with Congresswoman Eshoo um, and while we got it signed and signed into law in June of 19, we certainly had no, uh, you know, didn't had no idea that it would be um, upon us within six months, and that a pandemic um, like we had not experienced for a hundred years, um, that our systems would be put to the test. Um, the reason I got involved in uh, biodefense at all, was, and some of you may know this, was back in. 2001, I became the U.S. attorney right after 9-11 in the Bush administration. And so I was, um, I was in federal service when the anthrax uh, attacks came to Washington, D.C. and across the country. 
And I learned, I actually was one of those offices that received a hoax attack. Uh, my office received uh, some powder. And so I became very interested in biodefense issues and kind of the um, havoc that it can wreak in our country and, um, and, and to individuals. And so when I came to Congress, Congressman uh, Rogers, Mike Rogers of Michigan, former FBI agent who had been involved in the first reauthorization in 2013 asked me to you know, get involved and learn more about this. I am similarly, now that I'm retiring, trying to do that with other members. And while um, many members probably did not uh, focus on pandemics, quite honestly, because as you know, we often focus on what is right before us, um, uh, I think going forward, um, the work of your commission, uh, your, the doors or virtual meetings of many members, uh, they will be open and interested in all that all of you as experts have to share and to say, because we have so much to learn and we have learned so much. Um, I do have to tell you, this blue, this blue ribbon commission report um, really provided us with the framework. And I'm so glad that you counted. We, we worked through this religiously, I might add, to try to include as much of your recommendations as possible into this last reauthorization, which actually took years uh, to get done. Um, while you start, while this work was completed in 2015, I wanna also commend the commission for traveling around the country and meeting with experts. I participated in one of those roundtable discussions in Indianapolis um, that you held. And so this is a nat these were national recommendations. Um, and I, I really uh, believe that um, whenever I talked about uh, PAPA, um, we talked about this blueprint and all of you as experts who really led the charge on this. I think, um, so I wanna thank you for that. Certainly the country did not even know what strategic national stockpiles were until the pandemic hit. I would talk about them. I would talk about the fact that the country has been working on this and developing our capabilities really since the late 90s, early 2000s. And in fact, the national strategic, the stockpile used to be called the national pharmaceutical stockpile. And that's what I think we really did focus on, it seems, so much on ensuring that there were pharmaceuticals, therapeutics in the stockpile. Uh, I want to commend you all for that work. But I think what we learned is that the stockpile um, was really not prepared in, to handle this pandemic for this long a period of time. It seems that the stockpile was designed much more for a chemical, biological, radiological incident that was more geographic in nature and that was shorter term in nature. And I think we now have to think differently, um, and this certainly has caused not only us, but the American people um, who didn't know what the SNS was to now realize how do we need to reform the SNS? What do we need to be doing differently? Um, and certainly, uh, while there were PPE, which that was another term that most Americans didn't even know what PPE was until this pandemic, um, we certainly now realized our incredible reliance on China and on those foreign supply chains and the importance of bringing those supply chains back to American companies. And how do we incentivize more American companies to be involved in the production of masks, gowns, um, gloves, and all of the necessary PPE? You know, I commend our, our manufacturing companies for transforming. I had one in Kokomo, Indiana, that transformed from automotive parts to now ventilators. And how do we really look at what are the different things that we should be doing to incentivize American companies to make sure we have what we need in the stockpile. Um, and Anna Eshu and I, uh, whenever we see each other, talk about the fact that we in Congress should have been asking even more in-depth questions about what was in the stockpile what was, uh, and what wasn't in the stockpile. Although I have to share with you, it's the experts we rely on. All of those people that have been working the stockpile and managing the stockpile for decades we rely on their expertise, but we need to be going deeper and asking more and more questions, and how do we support that? Now, I have to tell you um, that Tom Cole, Representative Cole, and Representative Delora, 
as appropriators, um, they did make some impacts and they really took up the mantle and increased funding. And a lot of people don't give Congress the credit. Now it's not certainly hasn't been funded at the level it's needed to be funded at. Um, but I just want to remind folks that in 2015, the SNS was funded at 534 million. By fiscal year 2020, it had increased to 735 million. This is prior to the pandemic. BARDA had increased from 415 million to 561 million. Pan flu, pan influenza funding, uh, one of our most significant public health threats, increased from 72 million to 260 million. So there has been significant increase, but I believe that going forward, there is a window of time when the commission, when the experts can continue to impress upon appropriators and impress upon members of Congress in both chambers, the need to dramatically increase that funding. We certainly have through the CARES Act, um, but again, we need to continue to have sustained increased funding to be prepared for all CBRN incidents and pandemics. Um, I am really proud uh, that uh, Brett Guthrie from Kentucky and Chairman Walden um, produced, if you were not aware, the Energy and Commerce, the Second Wave Preparedness, a, a massive report that I would encourage you uh, to look at that in talks about um, what, what has happened and ideas going forward, testing and surveillance, vaccine and therapeutics and healthcare supply chain. I think it is in part a roadmap as well. But um, at the end of the day, the way we're going to be ready for to continue through this pandemic um, is to work with experts like your commission um, to find and to, to understand what your reports are, what your recommendations are, how has it been working for industry, whether it's, you know, I, I see um, Jim Greenley there from uh, Bio and others, how, what is working, what is not working, what is the what are our academic institutions saying? Um, what is working and what is not working? And I, I think we um, have much to learn. Um, I think that we have to and we need your reports and recommendations in, in fairly quick fashion. And they I think could even be staggered, but I think we also need your expertise in educating the states. Um, because I do believe that most states were really caught off guard. They don't have really adequate or really had much of strategic stockpiles at all. Our hospitals were not sufficiently prepared. And so I really believe that in coordination, I do believe that's the federal government's role to help coordinate all of that. But I think going forward, the states really need to also have their own stockpiles as well as um, the hospitals and our healthcare systems doing a far better job in stockpiling. Um, so I've rambled on long enough, um, but I am going to remain involved in some way. I'm not certain um, how I will remain involved, but as you can tell, it's something I'm very passionate about. This is something we need to be even better prepared for going forward in the future. I just want to thank all of you for all of your work, uh, whether it's with the Blue Ribbon Commission or whether it is with other commissions that you might serve on. And I look forward to hearing from you. Yield back. <laughs> Thanks, Con Woman, uh, that didn't sound like rambling to me at all. Of course, I spent my career in the Senate, so my standards <laughs> for rambling are different than the House. Thank uh, you. Anyway, you, you were great. Incidentally, I do want to point out that uh, uh, thank you for your good judgment in working with Anna Eshu because <clears throat> although she went to the other end of the country, she was born and raised in New Britain, Connecticut. So we're, we're all very proud of her. Okay, next, we're very uh, pleased to have uh, uh, Congresswoman Diana DeGette uh, also has shown in her work <clears throat> the vision and leadership uh, that we desperately need in this field, particularly because at least before COVID-19, uh, it was easy to push away this problem, but uh, uh, Congresswoman DeGette did not do that. She was uh, most significantly to me anyway, one of the principal sponsors of the 21st Century Cures Act, which uh, was in, has the intention of modernizing medical product development and supply chains uh, to not, in other words, just produce high quality research, but to make sure that research is being uh, translated into um, real solutions 
uh, to health problems. Uh, so we're very grateful uh, to her. Glad you're staying in Congress and uh, look forward to your uh, continued leadership and working with you, Congresswoman DeGette. Thank you so much, Senator. Thanks for, to the commission for having us here today. And I'm glad you recognize what my great mentor, John Dingell, always said, which is uh, he always called the Senate the cave of the winds. And so gl glad that to see a couple of, of yeah. former senators on the call. And I, I really have to recognize and thank my dear friend and colleague Susan Brooks for all of her years of work on these issues. Um, she really, along with Anna Eshoo, have, have been the leaders on uh, preparedness and on, on BARDA and all of those issues. Uh, I have told her more than one time that I'm sorry that she's leaving because she's been a great ally on, and friend on, on many, many issues. But I'll be honest, when she said that she was leaving because she and her husband want to spend more time in Wyoming riding horses, I really couldn't disagree with that. And I, um, I agreed that I would only ever say nice things about her if she let me come up there and ride horses with her. So she's in. So um, that should be a lot of fun. I, I want to, um, I, I also want to recognize my friend and, and former colleague, Jim Greenwood, who was the who had the position that I hold now um, as the chair of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee on Energy and Commerce. And Jim and I had a lot, we had a lot of fun together when he was the, the chairman. I was sort of the de facto ranking member of that committee. Uh, and uh, uh, what we say um, a lot of times is what, what happens in O&I stays in O&I. So we, we don't need to reflect upon all of our experiences. But, but the reason, one of the reasons I bring this up is because, um, as Jim knows, and as the rest of you know, Congress has really grappled with these issues of pandemic and emergency preparedness for many, many decades. Um, we went back and we looked to see how long we've actually been talking about this in Congress. And, and, um, and it's been for many decades. Our subcommittee alone, um, Oversight and Investigations, has held more than 15 hearings on pandemic preparedness and, and on preparedness issues. Uh, Jim had, and I, I've been on that committee my entire time in Congress, which is now almost 24 years, Jim had those hearings, his predecessors and his successors had those hearings. We had the most recent hearing on pandemic preparedness uh, in, on, on uh, December 4th, uh, 2019. So just a, l a little over six weeks before COVID hit. And um, I'll never forget uh, asking one of the witnesses at that hearing um, what keeps him up at night. And he said, well, I, I sleep just like a baby. I wake up every few hours screaming. And what he meant was, uh, was that, that uh, he was afraid, as all of us were, that we would have a pandemic hit. At that time, of course, we all thought it would be the flu, some kind of a new flu strain um, and not COVID. But, but even though it was a, a different strain, still the principles remain the same. And I'll, I'll never forget also at that hearing, uh, Representative Brooks, you may have been there at that hearing on December 4th, we asked again, as we had in all of the previous hearings, um, and I think we even had the blueprint with us. I held it up. Susan, I think you and I are the last two people who actually own copies of that blueprint. But, but we held it up and we said, what do we need to do to address this pandemic when it occurs? And unanimously, the witnesses said, you need to fund the national stockpile. That was what they all said. And um, I found it interesting that Representative Brooks went through some of the funding that Congress thought that it had given over the years. Because it was, I can say, as somebody who's been here 
um, many of us have recognized the the threat that that was uh, uh, that was out there. This is one of the reasons why BARDA was conceived of, why it was passed, is we realized the threat that we had. And as a member of Congress, I would say, and, and someone who's been involved in these investigations for many years, we, we actually, I think, had a heightened belief about our preparedness because uh, we, we, as I say, we passed BARDA, we, pat, uh, pop, we have PAPA, of course. And then it, as, as um, the Senator said, in 21st Century Cures, Fred Upton and I were able to include some key provisions that we believed would help uh, BARDA with fl funding flexibility that would help to leverage public and private partnerships if in fact and when a pandemic hit. And so imagine our dismay when uh, COVID hit, and and frankly, we, um, in, in my view at least, we were so ill prepared and so and 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 faced this unprecedented challenge with such ill preparation. And um, I, I will tell you uh, that the uh, 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 Representative Brooks was talking about the national stockpile. She is absolutely correct when she says that uh, when we looked at the national stockpile, legislators in particular thought about, we were, we were really thinking about um, terrorist incidents, other kinds of incidents, and we were thinking about uh, being prepared with, with medicines and prescriptions and so on. Uh, there were some times after September 11th when when we really did talk about PPE, we talked about hospitals' ability to to uh, handle large numbers of patients, always from the context of some kind of a terrorist attack or event like that. But uh, what we realized when COVID really hit is how uh, number one how how ill prepared we were with the national stockpile. Um, in terms of, of enough PPE, but also, uh, also that a lot of the PPE in the stockpile was not up to date and had expired. Also, we realized at that time how, uh, how there really was not a clear plan for how PPE would be distributed to the states. Representative Brooks is exactly right also when she points out that the states uh, had a real patchwork of, of, of preparation for some kind of a catastrophic event. Some states had some kind of stockpile, but I would venture to say most of the states had no real stockpile at all. They were looking to the federal government for that, that expanded um, uh, uh, source. And so, so what happened particularly in the early months when we needed it the most, was a really chaotic and uncoordinated response. And I will tell you, based on my state of Colorado, what we ended up doing was, was our governor, Jared Polis, and our congressional delegation, Democrats and Republicans, ended up in this, in this basic, uh, the best way I can say it is a scrum, uh, you know, joined by all of the other states and the federal government to try to pe procure PPE wherever we could at whatever price we could. And we had one situation, and, and there was no clear understanding. And I would venture to say, there's no clear understanding today as we speak about what the criteria are for qualifying. And so, so Colorado, for example, would see that, that we were low on ventilators at our hospitals with the influx of COVID patients coming in. They would call the federal government. The federal government say, well, we, we'll try to send you some ventilators, but you better get them on your own. So they'd go out through, through their various sources. They would try to get the ventilators. They would put down a contract 
for the ventilators only to have the federal government swoop in and seize those ventilators. And so nobody knew really what PPE they were going to be getting at any time and where they were on the priority list. And um, to, say, to say that this was frustrating to state and local officials, not to mention hospitals would be a grave understatement. Uh, so, so that was one thing we learned uh, as well as the real shortages. And again, I don't think that we have, I don't think that we have um, addressed those issues fully. And so, so the last thing I'll say looking forward is I'm now concerned about uh, vaccines. And I know this isn't exactly in, in this committee's wheelhouse, but I've got to say that if we had this lack of coordination and clear plan for our national stockpile around COVID, I'm deeply concerned about the plan for the approval and distribution of a vaccine. I think Operation Warp Speed has been an extraordinary collaboration between the, the, the scientific researchers, the Department of Defense, and, and private pharmaceutical companies. I think we are working at, as they say, warp speed to uh, develop and approve a vaccine more quickly than we've ever been able to do it. And at the same time, we're working on, um, on, on manufacturing the vaccine, even if we don't know these particular six vaccines will be approved. I think that's all wonderful. But what I worry about is once we have one or more vaccines approved, we still don't know how they will be distributed and given. And this is something uh, that we better figure out uh, because, uh, because the fall is rapidly approaching. And then, and then just the last thing I will say, um, as chair of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, we are involved right now in a ongoing investigation on vaccine approval and distribution. And, uh, and, and I think that everyone on this call will agree that if we are to have a vaccine that is safe and effective for the American public, even though we're working at warp speed, even though we expect that we will use emergency use authorization to authorize a vaccine, we need to make sure that every single health and safety guideline has been followed and that, um, and that we're not, we're not sh shortcutting any procedures at the FDA or at the other agencies to get this vaccine distributed because otherwise we'll lose the faith of the American people. They won't get vaccinated. Uh, and then this will only prolong the COVID crisis that we're having right now. Um, and, 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 and similarly, we're gonna have to figure out how we distribute that vaccine so it goes to the folks who need it the most. And with that, um, again, let me say thank you for having this important conversation. And thanks again to my friend, Congresswoman Brooks for all her hard work on these issues over the years. Uh, thank you, that was great. I'll, I'll begin questioning and then we'll uh, move around. Um, we're in some ways involved in two tracks now on our commission. The first is to continue to look at our original recommendations uh, updated by the experience we've had with the COVID-19 pandemic and to see what we can do to uh, learn from that experience. Uh, and, and what we talked about in 2015, which was the lack of leadership, et cetera. The second part is something new that I announced briefly, which is we've, got a, we've received a very generous uh, foundation grant uh, to begin what we're calling an Apollo project for biodefense. And it's really to look sort of over the horizon at how we might recommend the country create uh, platforms for universal vaccines. But I wanna come back to, to uh, what, what you said, because uh, I think you touched on something really interesting, which hasn't been focused on much. Um, we're obviously a federal system. Uh, this has been part of our strength, I guess, or reality, uh, going back to the Constitutional Convention where the states have authority. Um, in this case, it did create a patchwork in response. It was also somewhat tied in some areas to the decision by the administration 
this one to let the states uh, do what they would do. Uh, I wonder if either of you have any ideas about um, about next time. In other words, do we need to make clear that it really in a, in a situation, however we define a pandemic, that the federal government has to have a clear leadership and take over uh, and not, and we'll just leave it to that. In other words, to overcome the patchwork problem that you, uh, Congresswoman, to get talked about. Well, uh, what, what, I, what I think it, the current system, as I said, the current system that we have right now envisions the federal government taking a leadership role. But what happened, it, so, so what it envisions is the states will have their own plans, right? Their own emergency plans, but right. the federal government will maintain the federal stockpile and will take a role. In my opinion, what happened here was that, um, that there was no clear, there were no clear guidelines about what the federal role would be and how, and, and, and we obviously had woefully inadequate preparation and, and stockpiles. So the states, which, had, which also had inadequate preparation and stockpiles, looked to the federal government and then they had no clear guidance. So, so what I would say, I don't think you can, I, 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 I think, I, I, don't take partic I don't take a fundamental objection to the concept of the state being, you know, being the, um, the or I mean, the, the federal government being the arbiter and then the states having their own responsibilities. But what I do think is that the states have to clearly understand what they're supposed to be doing. The states have to understand what they're supposed to be doing. And then the, um, hang on, let's see if I can get this off. Uh, the, the states have to understand what they're supposed to be doing and then and, and what their responsibilities are. And the federal government has to have a plan. So in other words, this federal government should say, if there's a crisis, we're going to do A, B, and C. And Indiana and Colorado, you need to do X, Y, and you need to have this preparedness. And here are the standards we're going to use to determine how the federal stockpile is going to be used. And that's what was missing here. It was just chaotic. Okay, that's a really interesting and helpful uh, analysis. In other words, we not only need to be better prepared, but we need to have guidelines in place before uh, the crisis strikes or the pandemic strikes about what the relative roles, certainly of the federal government is. Uh, Congressman Brooks, do you want to add to that at all or, or I have another question for you? No, certainly. I think I, I, agree with, uh, I agree with my wonderful friend and I have loved working with Diana DeGette. I've been on the O&I subcommittee and we have uh, really enjoyed working together and her leadership in this space and in so many others, I have marveled. And we are, the country's very fortunate. She's been in Congress and is gonna to continue to stay there. It makes me feel better. Um, but I do agree with her that uh, we saw the states competing in ways that were not healthy. And then you also would see states maybe hoarding um, materials that they might have gotten their hands on when another state maybe needed it because the outbreak was worse in another state. Um, I, I do think that there's probably not been a situation in my lifetime where we have, where the issue of federalism has been tested so much and where we've actually seen it in action, where the federal government uh, has to really work in coordination with the states. But I am afraid that the states have really not been, uh, did not see their roles except for their local health departments and maybe their state health commissioner. They did not see themselves as being on the tip of the spear of a federal, of a, of a huge pandemic like this. And right. so I don't want us to move away from state legislators also investing and becoming much more expert in this area and becoming much more engaged in this. But I completely agree with, uh, with Diana that um, the federal government's role needs to be clear, not only guidelines, we need to have more training. There need to be more exercises. Um, 
so that you know my fabulous state health commissioner, Dr. Chris Box, um, that she, and while I know there were lots of daily phone calls that federal government officials had with state health commissioners, we have to remember that state health commissioners often, there is turnover every few years, probably with state health commissioners, and that there needs to be regular training and coordinated, uh, until you do those kind of tabletop exercises, um, even if we do put more set guidelines in place, I still think it's difficult to really uh, envision how it's going to work unless we do more exercising. And that's where I think we need more training. We need more um, of those types of things. And there are bills out there right now. I've paired up with Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan to strengthen the stockpile. It's moved out of committee. Uh, Senator Alexander has a bill focused on the relationship between the state and federal stockpiles. So, uh, but I hope that we can get this done as time is ticking away this, you know, this term and maybe really move some of these pieces of legislation. It really can't wait. And, and you know, let me just add one more thing to, to that is, is the funding, because um, even up, up as recently as this December 4th hearing that we had, we were assured by this panel that the um, that the funding was that 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 the agencies had asked for was in place. So so people say, well, Congress didn't fund BARDA. Congress Congress didn't fund the stockpile. Well, we thought we were funding the stockpile. What was happening is the agencies um, were requesting this money, and then the money was being reprogrammed. And we didn't, we didn't know that the money was being reprogrammed, at least as the authorizers. And the second problem with the funding is if you're relying on states to fund a stockpile, many of the states, certainly my state, uh, I don't know about Susan, about your state, we have, a, um, we, we have such a tight budget in our state, we're having difficulty paying for education and, and infrastructure and all that. So what happens in the states, unless, unless the federal government puts a specific number that it requires the states to have to participate in the federal program, the states aren't going to, it's going to fall to the bottom of the list. And that's what happened here is so, so where Congress thought that the funding that we had been authorizing all these years was actually being used, it was being reprogrammed, and then the states were not funding their stockpiles. Thank you both. Uh, I'm, I'm going to yield to Governor Ridge, but those were really helpful answers, uh, and they could only have been given by people who have been really involved in, in this, uh, because they came from your experience. I mean, I, I will say you taught me some things, uh, which I appreciate uh, very much. Uh, Governor Ridge is my co-chair, obviously great experience in this and so many fields. Uh, so I turn it over to you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, uh, Congresswoman, thank you very much for your participation, for your enthusiastic embrace and, and role in trying to make a difference and, and, and alter how the federal government has historically looked at this, even pre-COVID-19. And uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward uh, uh, to uh, making a difference in Congress uh, in the next Congress. I'm just, I'm, I'm a little skeptical as to what's going to get done between now and the election. But I must tell you, I bring a couple of, I'm proud to bring a couple of different perspectives to this conversation. Uh, having been a congressman in Congress for 12 years and a governor for six years, nine months and five days, I have uh, both uh, the federal role uh, pretty much embedded in mind and the relationships that you both have addressed uh, so appropriately, understand that completely. One observation, in particular, the last uh, comment made about uh, we gave them the money, and uh, but they basically disappropriated it. And it just reminded me of my longtime advocacy for a two-year budget where the first year Congress gives them the money, and the second year you exercise oversight to see what they did with it. 
Uh, they'll probably never get to that, but I think that's a crucial congressional function, which in the midst of everything else goes on, there's not enough oversight. But back to the rule and, and the commission. Conversations included uh, uh, supply chain, uh, budget uh, increases, uh, stockpiling, uh, incentives for public private sector engagement, et cetera, et cetera. One of the focus within this, our commission is creating an epicenter of responsibility and accountability because of the disparate nature and oversight of Congress. Look, I reported over a hundred committees and subcommittees over these kind of issues in Congress and the disproportionate uh, assi assignment of responsibilities in the executive branch. So you got it all over the place. And it's like, it's worse than herding cats. Uh, because if you put uh, cat food down, they'll all show up. It's like herding dogs. You put, so I've always thought, a lot of us have always thought, if you could control the flow of the money, it's a lot easier to get people to the table, to set priorities, and uh, frankly, to make decisions reflective of a overall strategy. And as the commission pointed out, there's never been a comprehensive strategy to deal with biodefense issues, whether it's related from nation state, accidental release, uh, mother nature, et cetera. So from your experiences, and it's interesting to have you both so involved in what's going on in the individual states. As a governor, I would love to have you been in my state because we love congressmen, people being involved in what we were doing back home. But from your perspective, if we were to create an epicenter, we wanted to put the vice president in charge, sit him next to OMB, bring in cabinet officials, part of a, a strategy group, and then create an epicenter that ultimately had control over the food dish, where the monies were going and working with Congress to make sure the dogs and the cats got their appropriate share. Just your observations relative to the need to find an epicenter that has responsibility and can hold others accountable after the country through the president and the Congress has set a strategy. You're just, if you want to muse a little bit and go on, because we're still kicking that idea around in our own mind going forward. We can't let this happen to us again. It's cost us, it's going to cost us four to five trillion dollars, which is borrowed by the way, and 200,000 deaths, which is even more important than the money, and there'll be more along the way. And unless we make some architectural changes, fundamental changes in the structure, setting a strategy, setting priorities, funding, et cetera, but it's a federal system and authorities dis distributed around Washington, D.C., all over the place. Your thoughts? Governor, I'll, I'll start out um, because, and thank you so much for your leadership in so many different ways. Um, in the, on, on this in, incredible topic. Um, the first recommendation that your panel made was to put the office of the vice president in charge. And you, um, I remember when this came out, um, I thought that was very interesting that you had, had recommended that. It was Vice President Biden at the time. Um, and I wouldn't say that until COVID hit, the vice president, hadn't been put in charge, either Vice President Biden hadn't been put in charge, um, and then Vice President Pence hadn't been put in charge until COVID hit, and then President Trump did name Vice President Pence to be in charge of the overall response leading the coronavirus task force. Unfortunately, I wish that that had started earlier, uh, you know, shortly after the recommendations came out, but that is what I think the coronavirus task force bringing together all the FEMA, DOD, HHS, all the different groups, NSC, bringing them together, that's what the task force should be doing and should be in control of this. I think going forward, I think we will see that um, your recommendation about having an, the vice president's office truly be in charge, I think will probably remain. Um, and, but it, but there definitely has already been, and we saw it with HHS in charge of the stockpile 
and then FEMA kind of becoming more in charge of the stockpile. We saw that happening already uh, because the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response was in charge, which we had taken from CDC to the ASPR, and then uh, FEMA kind of came in. So I think we still have a ways to go. I do think the Office of the Vice President makes the most sense um, because I, I think we, we haven't yet we, we should have done it before this all happened. We should have listened back in 2015 and 2016, stood that up, and then maybe we would have been in a better place. But then yeah, the I, president did take up, and people were very critical of the president for naming Vice President Pence because it got so political, but yet that was what you all in a bipartisan way recommended. I appreciate it. And we're, yeah. I was, one quick comment, we're not looking back. It's not about assigning blame what is, what is. We can't spend a lot of time looking at, at, in the rearview mirror except uh, taking lessons learned and applied. And, uh, and we even having continuing discussions on the commission uh, around that very issue. Where is the epicenter? Where do you get maximum value, maximum input, maximum accountability to really bring these disparate groups throughout the federal government right. together and then build that relationship with the state? So I appreciate your comments. I, yeah, I, let, me, let me just say, let me just say, um, I think that that what Susan is saying leads to to back to what I was saying, which is we need to have. Uh, it's true that was one of the key recommendations of your report in 2015 that the vice president lead this, but it it was never institutionalized. And when you're talking about a crisis, whether it's a terrorist attack, a biological attack, a pandemic. Uh, what we have seen, and we're, we're, we're not even very far in our rear view mirror, what we've seen is you have a wide panoply of agencies that all have to coordinate, which is why you made the recommendation to have the, the vice president uh, lead this. I, I'm sorry to tell you this, Susan, I, I had forgotten until this very minute that Vice President Pence had been asked early on to lead this because what what devolved after that the pr president trump asked asked the vice president to lead this but then the power sent but the power was never uh coordinated and consolidated the way it would have been had we had this institutionalized before so after vice president pence was was named to lead this in fact, what happened was many, peop many people intervened, and it's still unclear to people who's in charge. I'll give you an example is, is um, when Colorado was trying to get ventilators, uh, I, think, I think Senator Gardner, somebody called Vice President Pence, and then he was told to call so-and-so and so-and-so. So, 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 so even though vi the Vice President was supposed to be in charge of coordinating all this. In fact, there were many power centers and there are to this day. And I think part of that is because the, the concept of having the, the vice president in charge was never institutionalized. I think this crisis gives us a great opportunity to do that now going forward. And I, I think it's a great, I always did think it was a good recommendation. Well, I appreciate your, uh, your reaction to it. And again, the bipartisan commission is gonna work this as closely with the Congress as they want us to work. Uh, because, and we appreciate uh, your leadership that both of you have shown on this issue preceding COVID-19. Uh, I've often said that uh, neither party has the wisdom of Solomon or the prescience of an oracle, but from time to time, some people are willing to take a look across the, over the horizon and say, this could happen. We better start paying attention to it now. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and next, uh, Senator Tom Daschle. Let me join my colleagues in thanking both of you for your extraordinary leadership and your eloquent presentation and answers uh, to the discussion today. We really appreciate it. I find it so gratifying to find two prominent members of Congress who are so bipartisan in their approach and, and uh, their respect for one another. And it leads me to two questions that uh, are somewhat related. Can you give us your assessment of what you think will happen this year in regard to further response to COVID? Is there any chance that we'll still get an agreement before the election or is it too late? And then secondly, as we look to next Congress, 
Where do you think we can find bipartisan consensus around these issues as we go forward and try to set an agenda? Is there anything in spite of the depolarization that you think can be the common ground as we look to the next Congress and where we set the agenda? <clears throat> The chairwoman should go first. <laughs> well, well um, I, I would be curious to hear what, what Susan's hearing about another response bill. And it's interesting because we don't have a lot of time left, but we do have enough time left to do something. And um, I, I am hearing that there are fits and starts of negotiations. Uh, I will say that, that I think we do need to have, I, I think everybody agrees we need to have something. And, and I, I, going into the fall, for example, the small businesses in my district that got the PPP loans, they, they are, that, that money is run out and now they're trying to figure out what do they do for the fall. The restaurants, you know, they've, some of them have been able to do outdoor dining and whatever, but now that's going to end. So, so we have to do something, I think, to shore up small businesses at least till the end of the year. And the, the same thing is true uh, for people who are unemployed. In my district, we have a lot of gig workers. We have a lot of uh, people in the hospitality industry. Again, these jobs are not coming back before the end of the year. We're gonna have to figure out uh, some kind of an equitable compromise to help those folks be able to pay rent and eat. Seriously, every day we get calls in my office about people who are hungry and that's just you know that's unacceptable and i think we can all agree on that and then the third the third thing we're going to have to do is figure out what we're what we can do to help our state and local governments this goes directly to the to the the charge of this commission because states are trying to figure out how they're going to pay for testing for ppe if if covid rates go up again in the fall and they have the state budgets have absolutely been decimated. So I, I think that we should be able to have room. Uh, every so uh, just in the last day or two, we heard some rumblings from the White House that President Trump would like to see something. I just I just think we should we should let me just say this and then I'll turn it over to my colleague. I think that if you put me and Susan in charge of negotiating the next deal, we'd have it done by Monday. Don't you think so, Susan? I agree. <laughs> I, would like to, I would like to make that motion. <laughs> I second it. I agree, and I agree really with, with everything that Diana has said. Um, I, I do think we can get um, a deal this Congress. I was also heartened to hear that so many uh, Democrats are really pressuring the speaker to try to get a deal. And similarly, we have to be pressuring our leadership on our side to make this happen. And um, PPP, I think, was, uh, was a huge success for millions of employees across the country and those businesses um, bringing them back or paying them while they had to remain closed. And we need to continue that. Um, I think the point of contention, probably one of the points is at what supplemental level of unemployment, is it the $600 a week or is there a phased in approach that we should be taking because some folks are sitting out of the workforce when people are trying to come back. Um, we've got to continue to push that unemployment number back down to what the historic low was. Um, but also we, we have to take care of our healthcare workers. Um, you know, we're going into flu season. We're going to probably see a, a lot more illness uh, around flu. And so we've got to make sure that there is funding for those frontline healthcare workers. And then the other area as well is um, education. And uh, we have got to do more. To, and Diane and I are, are missing a hearing right now with the FCC. We have got to do more as so many kids are learning remotely. And uh, that has been a massive challenge for the country and that digital divide, uh, we have to close that. It is so not fair for our rural kids and in other areas to not uh, have access in their homes to their, their education. Um, I'm the mother of a teacher, daughter of a teacher, sister of a teacher. We have to make sure that um, 
that we're putting some more funding and helping our states and helping make sure that broadband and connectivity is critical. We've all learned this. I think the future of work is gonna change. It'll be interesting to see when we go back and what the new normal is, but I think we'll all be doing a lot more Zoom meetings and WebEx and all the other platforms we're now learning, um, I think for a long time going forward. So I, I, the question, and I hope that the country pressures our leadership and the president wants to get a deal, I really am hopeful um, and think in many ways we ought to be staying until we get the deal done. Um, and so th that's important. Um, and uh, Senator, for your next uh, question, and thank you so much um, for your leadership. Um, the question, would you repeat the question once again? Because Diana and I both went on about the deal because we're so focused on the deal. Oh, and thank you, like thank you for that. that. And I, I second that. the motion to put you both in charge. But I, <laughs> the second question was really whether you thought there was uh, any opportunity for real consensus on an agenda next year in the next Congress? Where you think, in spite of all the polarization, there may be a chance for meaningful consensus and movement on some of these issues? Well, if I could very briefly, um, part of why I loved working on pandemic legislation, particularly in the House, we had significant consensus on most issues. Um, not only Anna and myself, but Frank Pallone, Greg Walden, the chairmen of the committee. Our committee really didn't have any knockdown dragouts around the PAPA legislation. We had more challenges, quite frankly and sadly, with the Senate. And the Senate, we weren't able to get it done in the last Congress. We got it through the House in the last Congress, and there were more challenges because things were being put into PAPA that were causing more problems in the last Congress. Once those were resolved, it was one of the first pieces of legislation that the Democrat-led House brought up in uh, January of 19, and I was so pleased by that. So I think there will be significant consensus because this pandemic has hit Republican Democrat districts alike in very, very hard, difficult ways. I think there's huge opportunity for consensus on many, many things involving the pandemic and on solutions going forward. We're in a sweet spot right now, I think for the next year or two in moving some real important things forward. It's very encouraging. encouraging. Thank you. And, and to that end also, and to uh, that end also, uh, Fred Upton and I are working on our successor to 21st Century Cures, two, Cures 2.0. And I think that uh, there will be a lot of issues, including some of these issues in Cures 2.0. Uh, and I think we can get good bipartisan um, support around that. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thank you both. Uh, I want to just pick up uh, from my own experience when you talked about this being we're in a sweet spot for the next year or two. <laughs> Tom was leader of the uh, Democratic leader of the Senate after 9-11. Uh, and um, uh, we both created the Homeland Security Department, uh, created the 9-11 Commission, and then adopted the reforms of the 9-11 Commission. There were occasional battles, but they were not partisan. Uh, uh, really, people got it. They were more turf battles uh, in the administration, et, uh, et cetera. So I, I think that's a very important point you've raised, that for us and for uh, the next Congress and the president uh, next year. I appreciate it. Jim Greenwood, uh, we've got a few minutes, and so we'd love to give you a chance to ask some questions. Okay, um, and I'll try to be brief. So hello to both of my good friends. Um, uh, Governor Ridge said it's, you know, our, our intent is not to look back and cast blame and so forth, but it, looking back is instructive. And we've talked about our five-year-old blueprint by sheer coincidence, I happened because of another project I'm working on, go down into my basement this morning and pull out from my files this, which is a report that Diane DeGett and I worked on. Uh, it, was a, it was a hearing we held in May of 2003, 17 years ago. It was called SARS Assessment Outlook and Lessons Learned. SARS, of, of course, is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which is what this coronavirus, as SARS was a coronavirus, um, brings about. Uh, and we had before us that day Dr. Fauci 17 years ago, and we had Julie Gerberding, who was the head of the CDC, and uh, a Congressman DeGette, in a question that you asked Julie Gerberding, what do we need to do in the future? She said, we, 
She talked about the fact that the public health system has been allowed to deteriorate for years. 17 years ago, she said that. She said we need better planning, laboratory capacity, more epidemiological capacity to detect early and to respond and to rapidly communicate. We need training. Um, so we knew all of these things a long time ago. Uh, only, 17, only 774 people died in 2002-03 from SARS. Probably twice that many people died, and that was worldwide. Probably twice that many people died in the last 24 hours in the U.S. So to follow on, on uh, uh, Tom Daschle's question about next year, um, having now, uh, you know, I, I think it's clear that the reason we didn't respond 17 years ago and we didn't respond five years ago is because no one really thought something like this would happen. Now it has happened. Um, and, and, and I just want to further maybe get a little bit more comment on what it's going to take to actually, uh, you know, a third of the people in this country still think this is a hoax, right? That it, it's a, a conspiracy theory. Will we really have the bipartisan resolve to do the kinds of things that our report of five years ago and our report of 17 years ago have called for? <clears throat> Well, I, I mean, I, I think what happened, Jim, is at, so, so we had these urgent hearings after SARS. We had these urgent hearings after Ebola and, 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 and MERS and so on. And, and then, luckily for us, we dodged the bullet that we are now facing right now. Because, we, because since the, the viruses were able to be contained, they were not so horribly transmissible, we, we sort of thought, well, okay. And, and we did make some, some, we did make some uh, adjustments along the way. I mean, we, it's not like we did nothing. We did make some adjustments, but, but now what we've realized is we need to have a fundamental restructuring. And, and I know there's a couple of bills right now. Um, Chairman Thompson has one, Congresswoman Murphy, there might be some other ones. Uh, to put together sort of a 9-11 commission after right. this to really do the hard work to figure out what we need to do. And then we just need to make sure there's the political will to both put the structure in place and the funding. And I, I think there will be. I think what Susan said is exactly right, which is um, th this disease has impacted every district from Republican districts to Democratic districts. and. And and while it's true, a third of the people, uh, the, a third of the people are denying the the virus. I don't think the public health people anywhere in the country are denying the virus. Uh, Jim, I love that you uh, had that copy of your, you know, SARS hearing with Diana, and to remind people and to let people know truly, Congress has been working on this for, for so long. Um, I think this will be a very different um, Congress in the future in that, um, again, not that many people truly paid attention to pandemics or CBRN threats. Um, and now every member of Congress has had to deal with it. And there isn't a member of Congress that I know of that is certainly denying how severe this is and how horrible it's been um, in their district. I think what people have uh, been concerned about is that there was a lot of ambiguity at the beginning about what measures to take. And there has, and because of those mixed messages coming from science, because science, our scientists and our best and brightest really didn't know, I think that um, has set us back in some ways. Uh, mask, no mask, and all of those issues, I am afraid, you know, caused a lot of confusion. Um, but I, I completely agree that our public health folks, particularly our local public health officials, are underfunded. They are truly understaffed. I mean, I visited with all of mine around the time of Zika, and I know Diane and I were really involved in the Zika response and, uh, you know, horrible disease. Uh, in, impacting the world. And we were lucky in many ways that it didn't get much worse in this country, although it, it definitely hit Puerto Rico, Florida, and other states really hard. Um, but I think this is going to be different. Um, and again, I think local, local 
as well as states and the federal government are going to have to fund our public health systems at a much higher level than we have been funding them. And I think the American people are going to demand it um, because this has obviously impacted everyone's way of life so dramatically. I think it's a top, you know, it's certainly, you know, top issue in this campaign uh, all across, you know, um, whatever people are running for, you know, COVID is top of mind and we're going to have to really think about things differently. And kudos to the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Commission truly did change the way government operated. I think having a commission is going to be very important. The question is, when does the commission convene? When yeah. does a commission get stood up? We have to get far enough away from the election and we're actually still in the middle of the pandemic and I don't really know the answer to that. I'd be curious what you all think. When is it appropriate for a commission like 9-11, which was truly not political and truly bipartisan, when can we find those members to be on a commission that don't you know, spend a huge amount of time and effort pointing fingers, looking back in a negative way and come up with the really positive recommendations that the 9-11 Commission did. And I don't know when that time is because we're still in the middle of it. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know we're up against the clock. I'd just like to close with a brief comment if I could. Um, and I mentioned this in my opening remarks, but I don't think the two congresswomen were with us. Um, not only is Congress and the next Congress going to have to be dealing with all of this as we've been talking, um, but it's also going to re up, take the issue of drug pricing and affordability and accessibility. And we have seen in the last six months the extraordinary capacity of this nation's biopharmaceutical industry to develop diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines in, in literally warp speed. Um, well, not literally, but in warp speed. And um, as Congress is taking up those other issues, I think it's just absolutely critical that we all remember um, that in making sure that patients have affordable access and don't have excessive out-of-pocket costs for the drugs that we all need and take, uh, that we don't in the process um, destroy the, the, the innovation capacity of this nation. And many of the proposals that we've seen would do just that. And so I look forward, even though I'm no longer with Bio, I look forward to working with, with you, Diane, because you'll be there um, and with the rest of your colleagues on figuring out how we can actually solve both problems um, without, without undermining our capacity to respond to the next pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that both of you, uh, members of Congress, had a favorable attitude toward the creation of a 9-11 type commission because the, the kind of uh, bipartisanship that I talked about that I experienced in the Senate and the House uh, after 9-11 was in part because of the bipartisan standard that the commission led by Tom Keene and Lee Hamilton set. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't want a commission, we, we've talked about this and, and whether we should recommend one and how it uh, should come together, but we, we certainly wouldn't want a commission to stand in the way of Congress while the commission is working, both responding to COVID-19, but also doing whatever it might want to do. But there is a, a, a need, I think, for a for a, a, a bigger look. I mean, the, tr the truth is we didn't get the report. I don't think we created the 9-11 Commission until late in 2002. And then we didn't get the report until uh, maybe the spring of 2004. Uh, and we acted on it really quickly. Uh, and it was signed and enacted by the end of the year by most of its recommendations. So whether we can take that amount of time, your questions, Congresswoman Brooks, about when and how to do it are really important. But I think uh, on balance, it we really need something like that. Uh, and it would help create the consensus in Congress that is already there in part, but that can be shaped by this kind of commission that Tom Daschle was asking about. Anyway, the two of you have been great leaders and you've been very generous with your time this morning. Uh, on behalf of the commission, I thank you very much for that. And of course, we wanna stay in touch with both of you and Congresswoman Brooks, you're not gonna hide from us. Thank you, Senator. I will. Okay. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice hearing, Diana. <laughs>
our next panel is on emerging biological risks. Uh, we're asking our experts to, to discuss emerging biotechnological risks and how biological threats like COVID-19 are becoming increasingly common. Um, our three uh, speakers today on this panel are Dr. Jamie Asif. Uh, she's a senior fellow with uh, the Global Biological Policy and Programs uh, Group at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And we know Jamie because of her uh, stellar um, background, of course, but also because she used to be our program officer for <laughs> Open Philanthropy. So we're happy to see her again. Welcome, Jamie. Um, we have Sohini Ramchandran. Uh, she's an associate professor of biology and director of graduate studies for the Center for Computational Molecular Biology and an associate professor of computer science at Brown University. Uh, welcome, Sohini. And uh, we have Nidham Madhav, uh, chief executive officer, president, and board member of Metabiota. Uh, welcome, Nita. Um, so, Jamie, we will start with you. And Jamie has some slides, so the commissioner should be prepared. She's, she's going to share her screen. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today and to have an opportunity to speak with the commission about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I'll be speaking over the next few minutes about avoiding biotechnology catastrophe, how the US government and the international com community can most effectively reduce emerging biological risks, <laughs> including catastrophic risks potentially that are associated with rapid advances in technology. So I'll start by framing this um, broadly to, to state uh, what's probably clear to everyone on the commission that you know, technology advances offer tremendous opportunities for economic development, um, public, advancing public health and pandemic preparedness goals. Um, and so recent developments are tremendously positive and offer incredible opportunities for the future. Uh, but as we're also aware, um, they come with unique risks. And that's what uh, we're going to spend time, I'm going to spend the next few minutes speaking about. And so part of what's driving these risks um, is the, the fundamental fact that it's now easier to read, write, and edit DNA and RNA. And th that is the, the underlying blueprint for all living organisms on Earth. And by reading, I mean sequencing of DNA and RNA. Writing is synthesis of DNA and RNA. And editing is um, targeted editing of individual genes or genomes of, of, of entire pathogens, entire genomes of pathogens. And it's gotten exponentially cheaper to uh, read and write uh, DNA in the past decades. And that has accelerated in recent years, as you can see in the, um, the plot on the right, which has been developed by Rob Carlson. And you can, in fact, order uh, fragments of DNA, increasingly longer and longer fragments from companies in the US and around the world um, I've included a few uh, uh, representative logos from US-based companies, as well as uh, a company in China, AG, BGI. And um, members of the commission are likely to have heard of the enzyme CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which makes it easier to edit individual genes and uh -huh. genomes uh, for a wide variety of uh, viruses and bacteria, um, including pathogens. So what are the implications? Um, so as a result, it's now easier to generate pathogens from scratch or to tinker with them, to uh, change how virulent they are, meaning how much damage they can cause a person if they're infected, um, how transmissible, how quickly they spread among human populations and animal population, um, and whether or not they are affected by medical countermeasures such as vaccines and therapeutics. For example, you can tinker with a pathogen and make it resistant to existing medical countermeasures. And that, that, there are examples of that. So, you know, this is complex and notwithstanding the fact that there's a uh, risk here, there are a number of researchers that are actively using these tools to do exactly this, to modify and synthesize pathogens and there are publications that show this work. So for example, back in 2017, a group of Canadian researchers um, used $100,000 of mail order DNA to synthesize horsepox, horsepox virus from scratch. Um, now, horsepox itself is not dangerous inherently, but it's a close cousin of smallpox, which is. And by publishing these paper, this paper, they've generated what's, what you could refer to as an information hazard. They showed, they made it easier for other 
people with perhaps less knowledge and skills to also um, synthesize uh, viruses from this family. And this has caused a, 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 a significant amount of consternation in the biosecurity community. Uh, but not everyone agrees uh, that this is a problem. It's controversial, depends who you ask. Um, more recently, um, in May of this year, uh, the Nature Journal published a paper on rapid reconstruction of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is responsible for the COVID pandemic. And so this is a paper that shows a methodology for how to you know, create SARS-CoV-2 from scratch um, if you don't have it in hand. Um, but it not only shows that, but it's, it's a platform technology for producing, uh, it's information that, that is a platform techno technology for producing a wide variety of viruses. So again, it's making it easier for, for people with less tacit knowledge and skills to do these kinds of things. And there are a couple other examples here from 2012, which are also quite well known. And I can, during the q and I'm happy to explain uh, the different perspectives on why this research was done, but it's, it's problematic. These are concrete examples of, of the, the challenges that we're talking about. So what are the implications for risk? What, why does this matter? Um, I think, you know, a couple points. One is that the lowering technical barriers over time mean that a wider range of actors can engineer pathogens with increasing uh, sophistication um, and have the potential perhaps in the long term to create uh, particularly damaging pathogens that could have catastrophic consequences. So non-state actors, you know, this is making it more possible for non-state actors to, in principle, engineer pathogens in the future. And we know that there's an, um, there is intent out there, and we have seen examples um, in the 90s. Uh, Om Shinrikyo made attempts, um, and also uh, the U.S. experienced the 2001 anthrax attacks. So there is intent. So this is a question of changing potential capabilities over time. And then there's also an increased risk of accidental release of an engineered pathogen. We're aware that there is an underlying baseline rate of lab accidents. Accidents happen, and sometimes they're, uh, they are very damaging. So for example, several decades ago, the Sverdlovsk laboratory in Russia accidentally released um, an aerosolized uh, uh, anthrax spores, and it spread downwind, and it killed many people. And more recently, a, a, a laboratory associated with the US Department of Defense accidentally really, uh, shipped 194 laboratories in the US and in other countries, um, samples of anthrax spores that hadn't been sufficiently inactivated, so they were partially live. Um, so it's you know, to the extent that you're engineering pathogens and creating dangerous things, there's always, a, a, even if it's legitimate work, there's a, a risk of accident that could be catastrophic. And then, you know, I'd offer another point about, you know, well, what does this mean for nation states? And this is really highly uncertain. This is my personal view, not necessarily the view of my institution, but that, you know, the lower technical barriers um, that, that we're seeing might shape the cost benefit calculations of some nations as they think about whether or not they want to um, explore the possibility of developing biological weapons or not. And, and before I get into the solution set, I would just offer that, you know, certainly the US government and other governments and national academies of sciences have made valiant efforts to address these concerns. We've got a number of regulations, you know, we've got the, um, uh, the White House guidance in 2017 on uh, potential pandemic pathogens. There's uh, dual use research of concern policies from 2012 and 2014. Health and Human Services have put out, has put out uh, DNA synthesis screening guidelines and that's great but it's just not moving fast enough and it's not broad enough in scope to keep pace with these rapid advances that we're seeing. So what can, what can we do about it? Um, you know, I think there are basically two goals that we're after. One is to ensure that the legitimate global bioscience research and development enterprise is not exploited, to defend it against exploitation of, by malicious actors that might be uh, seeking to cause harm with weapons. And we also want to take steps to reduce accidental laboratory release uh, risks for engineered pathogens, even in legitimate settings, but to potentially other types of settings as well, because they could have catastrophic consequences. So how do we do this? So I would argue that we need uh, a layered defense. There's no single thing we can do that's going to be a silver bullet. Um, there are, but there are a number of uh, intervention points throughout the research and development life cycle in the biosciences and in biotechnology, uh, ranging, you know, the early stages uh, uh, involve uh, pre-funding review, like making sure that before you as a government funder or a private funder, before you award a grant to a research project, make sure that you 
uh, agree that this is not irresponsible or, or dangerous. Um, there are institutional review entities that live at universities and, and potentially could live at private companies to say, to ask, ask similar questions. Should we proceed with this research? Is it, does it really comport with biosafety and biosecurity best practices? Um, at the other end of the spectrum, there are publishers. You know, the journals, you know, journals have been thinking about this for years. Um, should we publish this paper or not? Is it responsible or is it not? Not everyone agrees that they're making the right decision, but they are trying and it's an important Point. I would highlight that they uh, strongly prefer not to be uh, the only arbiters of this and they, they, they like to see upstream considerations as well, which is why I'm showing this whole continuum. And finally, providers of materials and services like DNA synthesis companies and increasingly cloud labs, they and others have the ability to look at their customer, decide if they trust them, decide if they're com complying with biosecurity and biosafety best practices and make an informed decision about whether or not they're going to provide them those goods and services. So the US government, as you can see, has an important role to play, but it's, it's one piece of a more comprehensive picture that involves the private sector as well and academic researchers. I'll, I'll move quickly to wrap up in the interest of time. So I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to talk about DNA synthesis and screening, particularly because it's an area where there's been rapid development in recent years. So as I noted at the top, you know, since the DNA synthesis is getting faster, cheaper, and more accurate over time, there are exponential decreases in cost. At this, and, and at this point, um, DNA synthesis screening is voluntary. Uh, about 80% of global market share uh, is screened to make sure that companies aren't inadvertently providing the building blocks of dangerous pathogens to malicious actors. Um, but there's a 20% gap, right? There's 20, you know, and, and that, could be, that could grow over time. And no country, including the United States, requires companies to screen DNA orders or customers at present. And we at NTI uh, are starting to believe that that should change. Um, and to, to, to make things a bit more complex, um, the existing biosecurity model where companies are, most companies are screening, um, that, that is at risk um, because um, we're now, uh, and experts are anticipating that um, benchtop synthesis devices are likely to be commercially available in the next two to five years. Um, what that means is you'll no longer need to go to a company and say, hey, can you please send me this piece of DNA? You'll get a device that sits on your benchtop that can be in your laboratory or in your garage and you can print DNA at home. Um, and that, you know, so we have to think about how we make sure that that future is secure. Um, but there's currently no, um, it's, it's the, we're still building that. It's unclear at the moment what controls will be in place for benchtop synthesis devices. Um, that's a matter of active discussion at NTI um, um, and elsewhere. So this is my last slide. Um, just wanted to sort of briefly share what NTI has been doing to, to talk about, to address some of the challenges I've highlighted earlier in the talk. Um, we care deeply uh, both about the broad sort of bioscience governance challenges that I highlighted, as well as the specific issue of DNA synthesis screening. And we partnered with the World Economic Forum, and in January 2020, we launched at Davos a report um, about these issues. And two key recommendations are in the report. One is to establish a technical consortium to develop an internationally viable common mechanism for DNA synthesis screening. So we can go from 80% market share to like closer to 100, try to universalize this approach. And second, to establish an international normative entity um, that could take on these broader set of governance issues. Think about developing global norms and best practices for, for, for governance of bi dual use bioscience research so we can really uh, effectively reduce those risks. And we've started to uh, implement those recommendations in, in recent months. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, happy to engage in further discussion during the Q&A. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, so Heaney, please go ahead. I'd like to begin by thanking the co-chairs and the commissioners for the invitation to speak in this important forum. I am a computational biologist and I'm formally trained in applied mathematics, statistics, and computer science, and I hold a doctorate in biology. My research program's goal is to develop efficient computational methods to analyze large biological data sets. I generally focus on large scale analyses of human genomes, but I've also studied global linguistic variation, digital pathology images, and electronic health records. 
In 2014, I co-led, along with my colleague, Dr. Katherine Smith at Brown University, a study that concluded that the impact of zoonotic diseases, like the coronaviruses, is increasing over time, surpassing that of human-specific infectious diseases. We found that not only is the number of emerging infectious diseases increasing with time, but also the number of outbreaks appears to be increasing with time, leading to an increase in the richness of diseases causing outbreaks over time, as measured by Shannon's diversity index within nations. This means that complex contagion is going to be a reality for us to battle moving forward. In my study with Dr. Smith, I led the extraction and automation of parsing PRO's World Health Organization reports from outbreaks during 1980 to 2013 in a database known as Gideon. The resulting encoded data set described features from over 12,000 outbreaks of 215 human infectious diseases. These records comprised reports from outbreaks in 219 nations and had over 44 million human cases. A unique feature of this study was that it covered 33 years of time versus one time point, and we could study outbreaks of the same pathogen in many locations across multiple decades versus its first occurrence globally, which is a common topic of study and also one of great interest. My work and other studies have shown that the biggest contributing factors to the rise in zoonotic diseases are climate change and reductions in biodiversity from deforestation. The sale and consumption of wild and rare animals also often leads to outbreaks. These factors all drive a well-known inverse relationship between disease richness and latitude meaning that people living closer to the tropics experience and will continue to experience more outbreaks in a warming world, and the temporal duration of seasonal illnesses like influenza will continue to change and likely expand in a warming world. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but for example, the 2019 to 2020 flu season was highly unusual in that both strains A and B overlapped for much longer than normal, and there were more cases of um, both strains in New England than there have been in the past. I read the October 2015 report from this group with great interest, and I've related my three recommendations to recommendations made in that report. First, related to recommendations 13 and 24, I believe that we need a national data-driven emerging infectious disease watch force. Surveillance is the key to preventing future pandemics. Ideally, such a watch force would advise many government offices at various levels of government, develop policies like travel restrictions to protect US residents, and also centralize outbreak data and develop academic collaborations for academic researchers to analyze those data. Somewhat related to recommendation 15, we need to prepare effective broad sustained vaccination programs, not only for SARS-CoV-2 when a vaccine becomes available, but in general in our country. This is particularly crucial because the US has seen cases of mumps, pertussis, and measles rise since 2000, despite having effective vaccines for these diseases. And we saw that significant enrichment throughout the world in the analysis of the 2014 study I described earlier. We must promote vaccination. It's an important way for all US residents to improve their individual health and the health of their community. Lastly, expanding beyond recommendation eight from the 2015 report, we need increased funding for interdisciplinary research to fight biological threats. I am personally very proud and grateful to be a National Institutes of Health funded researcher, but the research to protect the US from biological threats needs to come from funding efforts that combine mathematics and computer science with public health and life sciences. As last presentation alluded to, data is no longer a challenge in the life sciences and analyses of large scale data sets um, are crucial to innovation in these fields now. But such efforts will need to move beyond the NIH and increase investments in the National Science Foundation and in partnerships among federal agencies that fund scientific research. Such efforts would make innovative research to fight biological threats a sustained reality and would draw on synergies among the brightest minds in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Sohini. Uh, Nita, go ahead, please.
Thank you, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, you know, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, just to let you guys know a little bit more about me, I'm Ethan Mada, the CEO of Metabiota. And Metabiota is a company that specializes in measuring, mitigating, and managing epidemic risk. And we do this through both data analytic tools and by doing field work in disease hotspots around the world. I'm an epidemiologist by training, and I have about 15 years of experience in probabilistic modeling and risk assessment with a focus on developing methods to monitor and model infectious disease spread and economic impacts. And I've worked closely with governments, multilateral agencies, and the private sector, especially the insurance industry, to use these data and analytic tools to inform decision making, planning, preparedness, and response around infectious disease threats. So as we look at what's going on with the COVID pandemic, it's easy to feel powerless in the face of something so vast. But this is a challenge that we can meet. We can plan for future epidemics and pandemics by applying risk management principles in the way that we prepare for other types of disasters, including hurricanes, earthquakes, and floods. And some of this technology already exists. We actually already have analytical tools that we can use to understand the risk, to quantify it, and prepare accordingly. And, you know, kind of following on one of the things Dr. Ramachandran mentioned, uh, combining epidemiological expertise with these computational and risk management techniques, including extreme events modeling and tail risk analysis, can really help us to drive forward this conversation. And especially when it comes to understanding epidemics, the key to it is understanding the frequency and severity. As we heard, the frequency is increasing, but these methods can still be used to allow us to understand what a one in 20 year event might look like, or a one in 50 year event, or even a one in 200 year event, and what level of resources would be needed to be adequately prepared, and which mitigation strategies are likely to be most effective. And on these lines, it's important to note that pandemics are not a one in 100 year event. I know a lot of people have been kind of talking about this, and it's very tempting to think this way because there was a big flu pandemic in 1918. But this is largely a quirk of chance, and every year there's a chance that a bad pandemic can happen. By its very definition, a one in a hundred year event has a 1% chance of occurring in any year. And epidemics and pandemics are happening much more frequently than this. Um, we heard about the research uh, of the number of epidemics and pandemics that have occurred over the past uh, decades. Um, and we've also done similar research and found similarly that the uh, pace of these events has been accelerating over time. Um, and while there have been many bad events that have occurred in the past, COVID certainly is not going to be the last event. And the next one could be even worse. Um, we, we briefly touched on how the majority of these epidemics and pandemics are caused by diseases coming from animals and an unknown pool of reservoirs, and there are millions of unknown viruses. And this is, again, critical, uh, critically points to why the One Health approach is needed to understand um, epidemics and pandemics and their emergence. And while efforts related to epidemic and pandemic preparedness and mitigation may seem costly on their face, these efforts are vastly more cost effective than response measures that occur once in an epidemic or once an epidemic or pandemic is already underway. And we continue to see the mounting human and economic costs from COVID with over 900,000 deaths reported and estimated losses to global GDP anticipated to be upwards of $9 trillion, according to the IMF. And these economic impacts, it, it really doesn't take an event with as many cases and deaths as COVID to cause this type of economic damage. For example, we saw with Zika virus in the Americas, $16 billion of economic loss and coronaviruses such as uh, in the past, like SARS caused $56 billion of economic loss. And so future investments in preparedness are critical. And while medical countermeasures and diagnostics are undoubtedly important, we also must better leverage computational data and analytic tools and techniques. The risk management tool set I mentioned earlier is one key component, but there's also a large gap that must be addressed, which is a lack of centralized system for this data and analytics. And um, kind of along similar lines uh, to what Dr. Ramachandran had mentioned, um, there, there really is a need for something similar to the National Weather Service for epidemics and pandemics uh, that some have proposed as calling the National Center for Epidemic Forecasting and Analytics. 
And part of that, their mandate would be to aim to have earlier indicators of epidemics and pandemics before they reach a state where it's uh, much more difficult to contain them. We also need to gain a better understanding of which pathogens might be most dangerous even before they spill over into humans. And there's been quite a bit of research into this area and there's still more that we can do to have a really uh, early warning and early action against these types of events. If we only learn one thing from this event, it is the importance of early action and breaking out of the cycle of panic and neglect that the World Bank has identified in a report that they issued in 2017. That when an event is upon us, we're in this panicked mode, we're reacting to what's going on, and then after a while, this falls away from people's memories, and then there's chronic underfunding, uh, chronic lack of attention to this important risk. So we must embrace a preparedness mindset and take proactive steps to address the risk in advance of the next pandemic. And this will truly allow us to build country and global resilience. Asha, I don't know where uh, your network of experts is <laughs> remarkable. I tell you that, 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 that these three uh, testified in very different verticals, all of which are related. So I just want to kind of tip my hat to you and your team for identifying uh, these experts uh, and for their, for their individual contribution. I would ask each of you, because you bring a different perspective, but if you would reduce, say you're testifying before a congressional committee or subcommittee, and you wanted to reduce your presentation today to a single plea for government action based on your areas of expertise, what would it be? I see they're all related, but I'm just on a one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, I, I've got my, some of my own mind where I'd want you to testify, but it, I'm more interested if you could reduce your testimony, reduce your presentation to a plea to the government to get involved, because what the commission has done for the past five years, try to set priorities. There's a lot of things we need to do, but I guess from the, from, my question is from your background and the expertise you bring to this conversation, give us the priority you think is most, must be addressed immediately by government? Um, so I, it's very hard to reduce it to one, but I'll, I'll make my best attempt. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it's, um, so I'll make one point to sort of tie together the different presentations and then I'll offer a recommendation. Please. So, um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I really focused on sort of engineered threats and deliberate threats and, and uh, Nita right. and Sakini focused on natural pathogens. And I would just offer that, you know, the COVID, uh, pandemic is a really instructive moment. I think it highlights global vulnerability to high consequence biological events that could emerge from a range of sources, not only naturally uh, emerging, but also potentially accidentally released or deliberately caused. And we need to really make a significant investment across the board to, to protect against these kinds of risks. But you know, specifically to address the technology risks that I'm talking about, you know, I would make a plea um, to, to sort of take a forward, looking uh, to make a significant investment in a forward looking uh, approach that's focused on emerging risks that are co coming across the horizon. So it's very easy within government to focus on hair on fire. This is happening now. What do I do now to put this fire out? But we also really need to focus on long term planning and look what's coming, um, coming five or 10 years down the road because it could be a significant risk. Um, and I, that's why we're really focused on engineered bio threats that could come from deliberate or accidental release. And I think there's a lot of white space and there's a really big hole in the sort of developing biosecurity norms and best practices and developing more robust um, governance approaches that really meaningfully reduce risk. Um, so certainly the US government could do better in terms of its own stewardship, making a much more rigorous and robust pre-funding review process um, as it decides what, you know, the, you know, the DOD alone spends tens of billions of dollars per year on uh, research and development. There's a lot of leverage there. And, you know, if, if DOD alone started doing more vigorous um, uh, 
biosecurity review pre-funding, that would, could make a significant difference. Um, there's, it, it could incentivize, uh, the US government could also um, um, not only work, work to clean up its own house, but also recognize that it's part of a bigger picture, work with international partners and the, inter, in, and the international and the NGO community to develop a better global approach to uh, bioscience, best practices, and governance to reduce biological risks. Because even if the, U the US is in impeccable shape, um, it's a, you know, a hole in the net anywhere, it makes us all vulnerable. Um, so for example, you know, if the US government was interested in uh, supporting uh, the establishment of an international normative entity to really pursue these goals, I think that could really help advance that effort and accelerate progress. And then I would just, um, I would just also, if I may, offer that, you know, th there is a security sector component here. So um, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for the U.S. to make an investment in um, better, and this is my personal view, uh, better intelligence for biological threats. Um, it does exist, uh, but there's significant room for improvement. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and there also needs to be better connectivity between the existing bioscience governance tools like DNA synthesis screening and the law enforcement and security sector. They do exist, but though, you know, operationally, those connections are not as strong as they could be. And for this to really be effective as a security measure, those connections need to be stronger. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Very powerful testimony. Thank you. Sahini. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a, a really exciting uh, and challenging question. But I think echoing what um, both Jamie and Nita have said, um, I guess my, my plea as an academic would be to integrate data-driven interdisciplinary advisors um, from the fields that Nita mentioned, risk management, economics, basic fundamental biology, epidemiology, statistics, computer science, into um, into governmental entities that can advise every facet of our government against biological threats. Um, you know, the, I actually was also gonna use the term weather service when I was talking about that national surveillance group. I think it's a great um, analog, but as you all noted in your 2015 report, such a group would definitely interact with um, intelligence agencies, with international partners, with the State Department, with, with the Department of Education um, to help us understand how to keep our country and our allies' countries, our societies moving in future pandemics. And I bring up education um, just to say that I am also a mother. I have two young daughters and today is my first day with them in school since March. Um, which is exciting, but also a little scary. Um, their school principal told me that no public health official or physician has presented to the elementary school principals to advise them as they open schools. And I think that as we experience um, this kind of disruption as more the norm in our society moving forward, we really wanna see that kind of data-driven advice integrated into every facet of our society. Well, it, I, I love the way you framed it, data-driven advice. Uh, and uh, so many folks uh, ignore the reality that uh, there's a great deal of data out there. I mean, just as a commentary, I'm not, not a criticism, but I've wondered why some states allow 25% seating in restaurants and other states allow 50% seating. If there's a, a data-driven rationale, if there's a scientific rationale for one or the other, the people would be more forthcoming and accepting most. Now, some people don't accept science. Most people would say, oh, is that what the science would say? That's what the experts say, we'll do it. So I think that's, that's welcome advice. You just put an exclamation point on a personal point of view that I have. So I could just say, well, listen, I have experts that agree with me. <laughs> so uh, please, it's been very, very helpful. Uh, Nita. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great question. I think, you know, kind of echoing some of what Jamie and Sahini have said, um, you know, I really think the data driven approach, well, I'm a, I'm a data scientist also, so <laughs> I, I can't help but to, uh, to lament why we're not doing more of this. But um, I think, you know, that that's critical. And I think the other thing is getting into this proactive mindset, this proactive approach, and applying these risk management principles just as we can plan for hurricanes or we can plan for a one in a hundred year flood, 
you know, yes, sometimes these uh, measures will change. Sometimes the environment changes or the built environment changes. And then the one in a hundred year flood now is something that looks more like a one in 20 year flood or, you know, things like that happen. But that shouldn't stop us from utilizing this type of information and this way of thinking to more effectively plan for these types of events. And this can be both from a public health standpoint, from a social standpoint, education standpoint, as well uh, as you mentioned, and also for financial resilience, because uh, you know, a lot of uh, companies right now are being hit quite substantially. And um, the application of these types of risk management principles, including uh, business continuity planning sort of framework, preparedness mindset, and um, trying to better um, account for and offload this type of financial risk could also be part of the solution. Um, <clears throat> and then I think having more of a centralized location for the, the uh, data and analytics, as we've already talked about, I think is, is really critical. Uh, I can't tell you how many companies we've talked to who they're, they're asking us, well, is there something like, uh, you know, I just want to see like a hurricane track type of thing for this type of event. Can I, like, where can I get that? And, you know, the answer is, you know, from academics or from this paper or that website. And it's, I think it's very difficult to discern what the credible sources of information are. And there's such a, a plethora of it that, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult for um, the general public or, or decision makers to sift through all that and to have something kind of a centralized voice that uh, consolidates this information and makes it digestible, I think would be something uh, very important to have. Well, I appreciate one, the notion of just a centralized vo voice writ large as we try to determine what the epicenter of responsibility and accountability in the federal government should be. So I like that in theory and in practice, by the way. I also like your observation with regard to risk management. It made me think of my work with then Senator Joseph Lieberman and uh, now Senator Susan Collins in creating the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it, it, the notion around the creation was that terrorism was going to be a permanent global threat, uh, but it was a threat and a risk to our economy and our national security. And part of the, our job was to manage that risk once we've identified the threat. So the full notion of a risk management strategy as it relates to biodefense is very consistent with how people live and how government should do it. If you know the risk is out there, we need to manage it. And how do we best manage it? Well, there's some data. And if there's data and some experts can pull it together, you, can, you can't eliminate the risk, but you can manage it. So I would say, Asha, I'd like to put an asterisk next to multiple recommendations we've made when we take it to the Hill the next time and say, well, these, these experts that testified today agree with us. So your testimony has been very helpful. Thank you. I think I'm next. Thanks, Tom. Uh, those are good recollections. Uh, even then, when we were working together with Susan Collins, we were older than these three impressive witnesses. Amen. <laughs> so thank you. Thank, uh, thank you all on this panel. Uh, Dr. Roma Children, I want to ask you a first question, if I may. I, I thought your uh, uh, study, the 33-year study, was really quite, um, quite impressive. And um, it, it actually leads us in a direction we don't uh, think about too much, which is how, how can we prevent the outbreak of infectious disease pandemics or better act to prevent the outbreak? It's um, uh, inevitable that uh, obviously we're dealing with uh, causes. So um, talk a little more because you the conventional answer of why infectious disease pandemics are happening more often as if people are traveling more than we used to. But um, you, your answer briefly uh, when, when in your opening statement was more complicated than that, uh, which pointed to environmental factors. So to what extent are, are, is the increase in infectious diseases uh, zoonotic or a human caused or accidental? To what extent uh, it is, uh, have environmental factors like climate change affected it? And is there anything we can do at the source of this problem to, uh, uh, to better uh, curtail it? Yeah, um, it's a wonderful question, Senator Lieberman. So 
um, my perspective based on my research and, and research in and, um, ecology and evolutionary biology, which is my home department in addition to computer science at, at Brown University, um, is that, so you're right that human behavior and travel is what can take um, an outbreak or an epidemic to a pandemic. And definitely we saw that happen very rapidly with a SARS-CoV-2. Um, uh, the way that it came to my own home state of Rhode Island was through a family who traveled to Europe in March and came into contact with some people who had been in China, right? So that, that definitely exacerbates things. But the initial outbreaks are still, based on our study and other similar studies, most concentrated in the tropics. And um, there are sort of two competing things that happen. So one is that climate change is changing our seasons. It's changing how warm the warmest parts of the world are. It's making um, more dramatic storms happen. Um, and in many parts of the world close to the tropics, there's a lot of deforestation that's happening, um, partly uh, by those nations, partly because of demand from other nations for products that lead to changes in land use, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that also contributes to a warming world. When the forests of the Amazon get cut down, that also um, speeds up how much our world is warming. But um, when forests are cut down, the kinds of organisms, or when there's a large disturbance, like a large fire, the kinds of organisms that tend to survive after such a big disturbance tend to be the organisms that carry diseases that then spill over to humans. So these oh. are organisms like bats, um, rats, uh, things that have in all of human history caused outbreaks. And these are also parts of the world where there is an economy for selling and consuming um, rare animals that might lose their homes because of deforestation or changes in land use. So then if you add the fact that these specimens that are valuable and that some people make their life selling them in wet markets or trading them or trading their skins or furs, um, all of that adds up to more exposure and more of a chance to spill over. Um, so if, um, if you were asked, uh, is there anything we can do? I mean, apart, apart from uh, confronting climate change, but it really, I thought your answer about deforestation was really interesting. So if you were the king, queen of the world, uh, what, what would you say? Uh, would, yeah. would you try to stop th this at its source? So, yeah, I, w I guess um, if I were queen, maybe I could say two things. <laughs> so I would say one would be um, curbing deforestation globally has to be like it's key to maintaining biodiversity actually reduces the chance that spillover happens to humans based on the research that I've done. And of course, we have other experts here who could um, explain that that might not be categorically completely true. But um, it, it, from the research that I've done, that seems to be true in research of my colleagues. But the second thing I would also say is to, you know, globally, um, every country, but especially the countries where there's this sort of rare exotic wildlife trade and these um, live slaughter markets, like we all, every government has an interest in curbing those because those also just lead to dangerous situations for humans where they're in too close contact with exotic animals and that can just increase opportunities for these zoonoses to spill over. Thank you, that's very helpful. I, I uh, you know, I, time's running, so I'm gonna yield and let Senator Daschle take it from here. Thank, thanks to all three of you. Uh, I would like to re-engage you, uh, not now because time is running, uh, to help us on what we uh, talked about in my introduction, uh, which is we've launched a new project, which we're calling the Apollo Project for Biodefense. And it's really an effort to see how we can uh, better invest in and coordinate the uh, science and technology research um, uh, uh, innovation <laughs> programs, public, private, academic, to um, really create, I mean, to jump beyond, over the horizon, uh, and ideally uh, our vision is a universal, universal platforms for uh, the development of vaccines uh, for uh, flu and virus. But I, I'm just gonna leave you with that thought, and if it's okay, we'll come back to you uh, afterward. Uh, thanks very much for your work. Very helpful, all three of you. Tom? 
Now, let me just uh, join Joe and Tom in thanking the three of you for just an outstanding set of presentations. I found it very, very informative and, and, uh, and really appreciate your time and the leadership you've shown. I was curious, so much of the discussion has been around data, the reference and discussion about the importance of data. We are going through an amazing transformation with artificial intelligence in so many different contexts. And I'd just be curious if you could to comment on what you think the implications are for the applications of artificial intelligence in this area, good and bad. I, I, I worry a lot about our lack of preparedness with regard to how AI is going to be managed and administered going forward. And I'd just be curious with your extraordinary expertise in this field, whether you could comment on what you think the implications are. Maybe I can jump in here, uh, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a really good question, a very important question. Um, and I think maybe to speak to a couple of potential uses of AI in this uh, arena, I think we, uh, we've identified that currently um, one application is really in um, natural language processing of various sources of unofficial data streams. Um, you know, this has uh, proven to be useful in the, in the past. And a lot of times these are the data sources where we get the early indicators that something is brewing uh, before it reaches any official channels you know, before WHO reports it, before CDC reports it. So I think there's more that could be done in that area. Um, I think there's been some mixed success. So that could be an area of further um, interest. I think another area that uh, where AI could really uh, fit in is in um, trying to better understand what it is that causes once a virus or pathogen spills over then what's going to, what are those characteristics that are going to make it then <clears throat> spread effectively from person to person and potentially, you know, be a, a much larger um, epidemic or pandemic? Because a lot of times you have these spillover events and then it it's putters, peters out to a stuttering chain and then you don't really get the sustained transmission. And I think we still don't really have, um, you know, a clear understanding of what causes this. And I do see that um, AI could help, um, you know, with a large data set of viruses, for example, that it could, um, you know, could, could be unleashed upon and then uh, try to come up with some of this um, potential information. But I think this also speaks to some of the pitfalls that we might see, which is that I think there's still kind of an issue with the underlying data. And I think um, it's less that the data is not being collected, but more that uh, the distribution mechanisms are still quite antiquated. Uh, there isn't really a kind of, you know, end-to-end -end linkages of these data that uh, keeps them timely and consistent. And, you know, in general, I think this is kind of an issue with public health data. We have it in the U.S. and globally, and I think um, it's, it's still an issue that um, needs to be addressed somehow to work out this uh, issue of data sharing. If I may, I, can, I would also like to, to chime in here. Uh, thank you, it's an excellent question and a very timely one. Um, so, so like Dr. Madhav, I also believe that there are both opportunities and risks inherent in this development. Um, so at first I'd like to start by foot stomping the point that Senator Lee Bitterman made a few moments ago about the importance of um, making a significant investment in uh, sci you know, science and technology to help combat these risks, um, including uh, you know, for universal platforms to develop vaccines, but also uh, pathogen agnostic approaches to a variety of, of uh, response tools for, for uh, pandemics. Um, including medical countermeasures, but also uh, biosurveillance approaches, incorporating sequencing, um, so we can sort of detect novel pathogens that we haven't seen before and we perhaps don't know what they are, um, as well as platform technologies to enable us to rapidly develop new diagnostic tests for new pathogens. So I just wanted to start with that as a frame and sort of couch AI in that context. So if you think about a future where we have the ideal uh, biosurveillance system globally that we would love to see that has um, integrate you know in, um, has the data management tools that that um, uh, that Nita and Zahini are talking about um, 
but also incorporate sequencing, there's a challenge there where if you know, how do you pull the signal from the noise? If you're constantly taking in data about, well, we, this pathogen, we've seen this pathogen or this virus or this bacterium is in the environment, what does it actually mean? How do we know when we're seeing a pathogen that's new or dangerous? Um, and how do we pick that signal out of the noise? I think AI has tremendous potential to help us navigate that challenge. Um, in terms of the ability to engineer bacteria and viruses, there are both pros and cons here. So, you know, when you think about, you know, what does it take to build a new kind of virus or a new bacterium that could be worse than what we see in nature, that's actually incredibly technically challenging. The existing pathogens have evolved over time and they're very robust. And it's actually very hard to change them to make them uh, more virulent or more transmissible without breaking something. Biology is a very complex system that we don't understand, you know, we don't understand organisms down to the fundamental principles necessarily. Um, and so it is possible that AI can help us manage and accelerate these design build test cycles to sort of identify desired traits um, from novel engineered uh, biological organisms. And that could have beneficial uses like developing new uh, vaccines and therapeutics, or it could be damaging by developing new uh, organisms that could cause new kinds of harm. Um, and so it's really a double-edged sword and, and, and governance tools will be critical there. I agree with um, all the points that Nita and Jamie have made. I would say um, in terms of, yeah, maybe the only other thing that I would add is that I think a positive use of um, AI, in addition to what Nita mentioned about natural language processing to infer whether a problem, a potential pandemic is brewing or potential outbreak is brewing, um, is that AI could also offer, and I think this hasn't been leveraged enough um, in the current moment, the chance to analyze how comorbidities interact with the pathogen that we're currently most concerned about. We still don't know enough about what comorbidities are predisposing people to have severe outcomes or um, to die from SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> And um, ideally, electronic medical records allow us to study this more deeply and prepare for complex contagion. Um, but I do think a downside, which um, was in the 2015 report as well, is about maintaining the security of any centralized data resource. So the hackability of such resources is um, definitely an important concern that um, will need to be carefully managed. Well, thank, thank uh, each of you for your very, very good answers. I, I too share the concern about security and it was one of the reasons I asked the question. I think there is both peril and opportunity and I would hope there's a lot more opportunity than peril, but we have to be prepared for both. But thank you, appreciate it. Joe? Uh, thanks, Tom. Jim Greenwood? Orders. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and, and thank you to each of you. Um, uh, before our, our hearing started this morning, I was showing off to my colleagues that I, uh, a week ago, became a, a grandfather. And um, it's, uh, it, it's people like the three of you, and, and so, certainly the three of you and, and your colleagues, that will really determine whether um, this place, this planet of ours, is, uh, is a safe place for him to live uh, in the decades to come. Uh, and I don't know if you were listening to the previous panel where we had the two members of Congress, but there was a discussion about how um, our report of five years ago had uh, anticipated uh, the pandemic and had our recommendations been um, uh, all taken up uh, and, and act, enacted, um, how different the world would be right now. Uh, I talked about a hearing that I chaired 17 years ago on SARS. And again, uh, looking back saying, if only we had taking some of the recommendations that people like Dr. Fauci were making way back then, it would be a different world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit focused on, on you, Jamie, uh, Dr. Rasif, that um, on, on the uh, synthetic biology and CRISPR and, and gene editing and, and, and that, because I remember at least 15 years ago talking about the advent of synthetic biology and what was, you know, the ability of people to get tools that they need and the genetic materials that they need to synthesize uh, deadly viruses and, and other pathogens. Um, and, uh, you know, here we are still uh, unprepared and unequipped uh, to deal with that. And, you know, in our report five years ago, we, we had a, 
uh, it began with a hypothetical uh, congressional hearing about a, a bioterror event. And the point was, let's, let's not have that hearing. Let's not have the, oh, the tragedy occurred. Why weren't we prepared? Why didn't we anticipate it? Um, and, and that's still as true as it was, you know, five years ago that we're not prepared. Um, so yeah, I'd like to, to start with you, Jamie, if I could, and ask, you know, to, to, the, to the, the, the points that you made in, in answer to Governor Ridge's question about the single most important thing. And I'm particularly interested if you could touch upon um, the idea for some kind of um, uh, 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 entity that would sort of like a, a uh, I forget what you call it, institutional review entity, um, whether Congress needs to create that um, and should it be a, a national, rather than it be a, 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 a re institutional review for each company, each academic institution, should there be a national um, at, or even an international body that serves that purpose to, to screen um, the, the projects that are being undertaken in the private and public sectors? And then if each of the other two of you could indicate to what extent the, recommend, the most important recommendation that you have are moving from theory um, to you know, real, the kind of real action that, we, that the Congress needs to be taking right now. Thank you so much, sir. I'm, um, uh, I'm uh, delighted to answer that question. It's a really, uh, it's a great question and a really important set of issues. Um, so to the, in terms of the, you know, the building the kind of institutions that we need to really mitigate this threat, I uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, that we haven't taken the steps that we need to prevent the kind of scenario that you're talking about. And a, a major part of this is institution building. And I'll break it into two pieces. There is um, an institutional review component uh, that in our view is necessary at individual research institutes, uh, both academic and um, uh, private sector, and then there's an international component. So I'll start with the individual one first and talk about the role it, could, uh, it can play, and then I'll, I'll move to the second part. So, you know, there are already individual institutional review boards at universities across the United States. They're usually called institutional, um, they, they focus on biosafety primarily, and largely they are responding to existing regulations and laws and guidelines. A number of them have voluntarily decided to pick up biosecurity, but that is not universal. So I think one recommendation would be that we would want, you know, academic research institutions as well as uh, private sector research institutions to have such a review entity to consider, you know, biosecurity related questions when figuring out what direction of research you're going to take. Um, and that be really a widespread practice. Um, separately, we are, um, and, and so that, that, that's partially existent in some universities. It's, to our knowledge, it's not really widespread within the private sector. Um, and bio, you know, biosafety is widely considered. Biosecurity isn't necessarily, it's more ad hoc. And when you go internationally, it really falls off that model. Um, you may be implemented uh, in certain countries in a spot-wide fashion, but it's certainly not universal, far from that. If you think about the international component, we are also advocating for uh, uh, building an international entity that can help with the governance challenges that I was talking about. And part of the issue here is that there's a hole in the international um, system that really, there's nothing that really has a dedicated role to focus on this. There's a seam between what the Biological Weapons Convention is meant to do and what the WHO is meant to do. So the WHO is really meant to deal with naturally emerging infectious diseases, mounting an effective response, sharing guidelines, that's all critically important work, doing a public health investigation in the event of a naturally emerging pandemic. Biological Weapons Convention, you know, deals with state bioweapons risks and bioterrorism. But there's no one whose really res sole responsibility is managing the emerging biological risks associated with technology advances. And that's what we're really advocating we'd like to build. And we think that this institution could have two functions. One is normative or best practice focused, just helping to develop a globally viable shared view about what it even means to, to be responsible in your research from a biosecurity perspective. What are biosecurity practices? We don't have global agreement upon that. That would be a really important starting point. And then the second piece is 
figuring out a, a way to actually act on those norms. How do you actually put that into practice? How do you have governance mechanisms that incentivize adherence to, to these biosecurity best practices as, and perhaps even um, mete out punishments when they are violated um, in very uh, extensive fashion? Um, you know, there are pieces of that in the, uh, within the United States because the US has been working on this, um, but we have room for improvement here at home. I, you know, I believe that, or we believe that, that if an entity like that existed, it could help us improve our practices here at home in the United States and could help raise the level of best practice globally and it would make us more secure in the US and make the whole world secure. Thank you. Dr. Robin Chodden. Um. Yes, I completely agree that um, this layered level of institutional entities is necessary to promote biosecurity and biosafety. Um, there is a very rigorous biosafety laboratories review mechanism, which the CDC defines, and there are four levels of biosafety laboratories. Um, the strictest level, which are labs that deal with extremely what are called exotic pathogens like the Ebola virus, but also may work in some synthetic biology. These include laboratories at the Department of Defense. Um, there are only 13 such laboratories in the country and they can be found. Um, and just I'll also say is my own experience as a peer reviewer of NIH grant applications, um, it's part of my service to my profession, when we review grants that are, are requiring work um, that's with sensitive viruses, um, like schistomoniasis or um, things like that, we as peer reviewers and then the National Institutes of Health also have to check that all of that has been compliant. So I think, I guess maybe this gets to your second question, Representative Greenwood, which is to what extent are some of the things we're talking about theoretical versus actually already existent? I think that through the amazing investment we have in this country in research and development, um, we actually have a lot of the ability to uh, deal with these impending threats, but it's requiring a lot of crosstalk across many governmental agencies, um, right? From the CDC to the NIH to other federal funding agencies, and then also to um, core parts of our government. And um, so I think, I guess the only thing I would add is that, you know, recognizing the incredible purview that the CDC has um, and the ways in which it works with other national agencies will help us make our country more secure against biological threats. Thank you. Nita? Yeah, just to kind of add to what everyone's um, said, you know, I completely agree uh, with those points. Um, I think maybe to, to speak a little bit about um, going back to the risk management principles, I think um, at this point, I think it's not yet clear uh, where this would reside in, in the government. Would this be from an existing agency or would this be a new agency? Um, I think what's clear is that it needs um, broad uh, collaboration, both with public and private sector, um, and it needs a diversity of viewpoints, including public health, social science, and uh, financial management. And I think, um, you know, to the extent that that we, you know, Congress can support these types of initiatives and provide funding, I think that's that's really going to be a critical piece of, of what we need to do. Thank you very much. I want to just ask one question, and I can't remember whether it was you, Dr. Madhav, or, or which one of you mentioned the prospect of an international pandemic forecasting organization um, and sort of how that would be established to try to see whether, you know, there are in, indicia of zoonotic you know, outbreaks before they actually reach, reach the human population, this kind of thing. I think somebody analogized it to like weather forecasting. Um, anyway, that just sounded quite intriguing. And to the extent you guys have addressed this already this morning, and I missed it, I apologize. But if anybody could sort of provide a little texture on what that organization would look like and what indicia it would be looking for um, so that, you know, presumably it would be able to sort of nip things in the bud before we have a Wuhan situation where it gets out to the whole world. 
So I don't know who wants to take that first. Yeah, I, maybe jump in and of course invite um, the other panelists to uh, jump in as well. I think it's a, it would be fantastic if we had something like this. I think um, something that I mentioned previously was that a lot of, you know, I work with the private sector, a lot of folks are saying, well, where, where is like, I, I want a hurricane track forecast for this kind of thing. Where, is there any equivalent that's providing this? Um, and the answer is no, we don't have like, the equivalent of the National Hurricane Center or National Weather Service who's providing, you know, these types of forecasts that are coming out, you know, utilizing many different types of models and then kind of consolidating them into a viewpoint that uh, can be easily digestible for making decisions. And I think that that's kind of the piece that's missing right now. And something that um, if, if we were to have this pandemic forecasting type of uh, organization, that that would be a critical piece of what, uh, what it would be doing. Uh, of course, uh, it could also uh, perform within um, you know, very early stages of a pandemic or even epidemic as we look to where certain hotspots might be, where these viruses might emerge or spill over into humans. Um, this type of group could uh, work on, on those types of topics as well to give us a clearer picture of, of when uh, a threat might be imminent. Um, and then thirdly, I think part of this initiative would involve, again, as I mentioned, uh, you can't just have biologists working on this. And you can't just have epidemiologists working on this. Epidemics and pandemics are systemic risks, and these would require uh, input uh, from social scientists, from economists, and a whole array of other folks uh, trying to uh, make sure that we're understanding all the dimensions of the, the risks and the vulnerability within the population. If I could just add to that, um, one thing I would also add and maybe goes back to the point about um, AI and ways that it could assist in um, preventing future pandemics is that such an organization, I think, would also want to engage um, people with expertise in analyzing the news and news reports. So one of the issues that came up in the 2014 study I co-led is that you know, we were analyzing World Health Organization prose reports of outbreaks, but not every country when it has an epidemic or an outbreak involves the World Health Org Organization. There are certain thresholds that end up getting met for that. Um, you know, GDP can correlate with how much information gets released, internet usage with how much information about an outbreak gets released. And these are things that we have experts in our country who can model and actually from a lack of information infer that there might be potential issues that are brewing in certain parts of the world. And um, I think that that expertise in how different um, people throughout the world get their information and spread information would be a crucial part of that. And that could be something that um, natural language processing could really assist this office with as well. And just one last question, where would you all house this? Where would it be established? It's a really good question, and I, I don't I don't know if we yet have the answer to that. I know there's, you know, been some discussion that, um, you know, could it be something that comes out of HHS and ASPR, or is it, um, you know, is it maybe a a new entity? I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, ways that this could be done, and I think this this question is going to require a bit more study, just given the way how, uh, you know, public health and um, is kind of fractured uh, in the way the governance works in this country. With, with again, a round of applause to these exceptional panelists. Thank you for your contribution. Yeah, and thanks. This, this last idea that Ken asked about is yeah, really exactly. a very important suggestion. I mean, obviously yeah. the main purpose is that it gives us early warning, uh, um, as, as the hurricane predictors, et cetera, do. But it also puts pressure on governments not to conceal what's happening, hopefully, as there's some evidence happened in China. And it, I think, should inhibit the, the politicalization of these diseases um, because there'll be a fact base to act on. And so you can't scapegoat anybody for, for starting this, which, which usually uh, this, the, the uh, real target should be mother nature from all that we have learned. This panel is titled The Future of uh, Biodefense, and we have really two extraordinary 
uh, and capable witnesses. We're going to start with Dr. Kavita uh, Berger, Director of Board of uh, uh, Life Sciences at the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, in 2018, while at uh, uh, Greifan, I think it's Greifan or Greifan Scientific, uh, Dr. Berger was the principal investigator and author of the uh, Roadmap for Implementing Biosecurity and biodefense policy in the United States. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, as a result, she has been a sought after advisor to many US government agencies. Uh, Dr. Berger, thanks for your work. Thanks for being here. We look forward to your statement now. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank the, all of you on the Bipartisan Commission for inviting me to speak. I do wanna mention first off that my views are my own based on my work and not necessarily reflect those of the National Academies. Um, I was asked to speak about two things very specifically. The first uh, is the mechanisms for how the federal government can leverage science and technology innovations. And the second are areas uh, in biodefense where technologies could reduce biological risks. So to address these items, I wanna sort of highlight three main things. The first is that multidisciplinary research is absolutely critical uh, to enhancing capabilities to help achieve biodefense objectives as well as reduce biological risks. Most often when we uh, look at scientific advancements or developments that are rele relevant to the biodefense objectives, we often think of microbiology, virology, uh, immunology, medicine, and other life science disciplines. Uh, however, um, there are a number of other fields and other disciplines that have increasingly played a significant role in addressing uh, biodefense objectives. And I'll go later on through some of the examples, but the fields that have really sort of been um, included and involved in a lot of that research include things like computer science, materials, engineering sciences, physical and chemical data sciences, and even social sciences. These sort of examples, there are a number of examples such as um, the recent sort of interest, and I guess by recent, I mean 20 years of interest in synthetic biology uh, and engineering biology, um, additive manufacturing, modeling, biosafety, biosecurity, and even preparedness leverage advances across one or more of these dif different disciplines. And so, um, uh, being able to promote that multidisciplinarity uh, in the research community would definitely help to, um, to develop more transformative uh, changes, advances in, in technologies and in scientific information. <laughs> and sometimes sort of multidisciplinary disciplinary research is, is often referred to as science and technology convergence, uh, but I'm gonna refer to it as um, multidisciplinary research. The second thing that I want to highlight is that there are several opportunities and challenges to uh, promote um, multidisciplinary research and development. Opportunities include some of these initiatives that many of our U.S. government agencies support, things that are, um, are uh, initiated to address either biodefense or broader national security or even other societal uh, problem sets that um, enable the funders, whether they're DOD, NSF, NIH, NIST, DOE, and many others, EPA, um, to try and encourage scientists to address particular problems across a variety of different disciplines. Some of the challenges, however, in being able to implement this include, uh, they're very practical challenges, they all can be addressed, um, but they include things like um, differences in scientific approaches, so discovery versus design-based science, incentive structures, different types of norms, and other sort of things that are, um, that are unique to how science is done in different disciplines and the environment in which uh, different scientific disciplines are conducted. And then the second sort of major challenge is really sort of a technical challenge. Um, that includes things like uh, you know, when we're looking at data, different data types, structures, formats, uh, accesses, all of that contribute to technical challenges in being able to leverage data science or, um, you know, artificial intelligence and other sorts of uh, capabilities in the computational sciences, including modeling. Um, and in addition to that, we also have sort of a, a, an awareness or a realization of what the 
realistic capabilities of uh, disciplines and uh, technologies are. So sometimes we think too much of the promise or too much of the risk, but we um, oftentimes don't necessarily understand what our current capabilities are, what the knowledge and technical gaps are, and how we overcome them to achieve our goals. But as I said, you know, these challenges can be overcome. Uh, and some of the ways in which different US government and, uh, and even philanthropic or, or, or um, industry organizations have tried to address these include things like grand challenge initiatives, team, team science awards, challenge prizes, public private partnerships. A few of these examples are being implemented right now to, uh, to basically address um, issues related to this uh, SARS coronavirus outbreak uh, pandemic. The third uh, thing I want to sort of mention is, uh, is the um, advances or innovations that have and can contribute to biodefense objectives. And these advances um, range from um, things like exposure science uh, that helps to better understand how the human body responds to different types of exposures from biological, chemical, or other environmental insults. That information is critical for us to understand what types of detection and diagnostic tools we need, vaccine platforms, and even drug candidates. Um, computational platforms that help us better integrate and visualize data to better understand early warning of natural, um, or better have better early warning of natural and man-made threats. The major challenge with this uh, is not only the computational side of it, but it's also the uh, data, the structure of the data, access of the data, uh, and uh, all sort of uh, information related to um, what, what are, are the data sources and, and how do we really understand if the results are uh, real or not. Other examples include things like uh, next generation sequencing and uh, microbial genomics, both for viral and bacterial. Uh, and computational biology to better predict or monitor the emergence of biological threats or to examine outbreak strains. In fact, uh, in this pandemic, we saw quite early a number of computational biologists trying to understand the uh, SARS uh, outbreak strain compared to other SARS coronaviruses in uh, nature. And, and that's actually one of the, the reasons uh, those studies actually contributed to our understanding uh, of how closely related this particular virus is to, um, you know, to the bat coronaviruses that were circulating in, uh, in East Asia. Other computational models uh, help to analyze risk and help to predict consequences of different scenarios, not only health consequences, but also economic and other consequences, um, and even can help us, uh, depending on how they're used, they can even help us uh, try and get a handle on technology change or convergence over time. Those studies um, are obviously very new, but they are, um, there's a lot of work and a lot of interest in, in things like horizon scanning and using uh, some of these sort of computational models to be able to better understand those. Um, other sorts of uses, and I'll just mention a few more, which are that actually integrate both the natural and physical sciences along with social sciences. Um, are some of the efforts that have taken place to address biosecurity issues, explicitly the issues related to norm building and dual use research of concern, where we've brought in the science of teaching and behavioral sciences, social and cultural anthropology to better understand how to teach uh, scientists around the world about this issue related to dual use life sciences research and, and what to do about it, how to assess risk, how to analyze it and how to reduce it. And, and then we've also used social sciences to um, help us better understand uh, effective biosafety measures. So this whole field of applied biosafety. And I would be remiss not to go back and kind of highlight some of the engineering biological systems. So this whole synthetic biology or what it's being called now as engineering, bio, engineering biology, which is leveraging not only the life sciences, but robotics and computational biology, I'm sorry, computational science to be able to um, create new organisms that do all sorts of things, uh, including environmental remediation after an event, or to serve as biological sensors. Uh, so I'm hopeful that you know, these examples kind of illustrate that we have, that there are so many fields and disciplines that are very actively working across the entire biodefense uh, landscape 
to provide capabilities that would uh, hopefully help us better prevent, detect, and respond to a biological event, whether natural or man-made. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berger. That was excellent testimony, and we, we will surely have uh, questions for you. Uh, next, we have Dr. Luciana Borio, uh, who's a physician, a public health administrator, right now vice president of InQtel, which this commission has uh, depended on and been helped by, and uh, also continues to practice medicine at Johns Hopkins. We have a, a we would be remiss if we didn't. Uh, thank you, Dr. Borio, in introducing you because previously you were director for medical and biodefense preparedness at the uh, National Security Council. And uh, you were, uh, in my understanding, the principal author of uh, President Trump's executive order on uh, modernizing influenza vaccines in the United States to promote national security and public health, which is something we're very interested in, have been and will be going forward. So thanks for being here and we welcome your uh, testimony now. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. And, um, you know, I think you tell uh, technology is our mission, as you know, but optimism is our business. So <laughs> I have to remind myself of that every day. And uh, to start, I'd like to just make some uh, three key points, which is, um, and oh, by the way, as my colleague uh, Kavita Berger says, and I'm speaking on uh, my own personal capacity with you today. Um, but go back to my three key points. Uh, the first is that, as you know, this pandemic is not a one-off event. And if we are to protect our health, our economy, and the American way of life, we can't afford to, sn to hit the snooze button after this one. Um, second is that I think we need to really attend to the foundational by defense capabilities first. Since 2001, we have spent billions of dollars on by defense, primarily directed towards measures to counter deliberate bio threats. And they absolutely deserve our continued attention. But COVID has painfully highlighted that we have been neglecting foundational capabilities that are necessary to combat all types of bio threats, whether deliberate or naturally emerging. And going forward, we must focus first and foremost on these foundational capabilities that are absolutely required to contain outbreaks before they become pandemics. And third is that we must effectively integrate our capabilities. Uh, for those of you who's, who like movies and watch Gladiator, uh, where Russell Crowe you know, emerges as Maximus, he emerges victorious in a series of combats by organizing the fighters and harnessing their collective strength. The US has what it takes. We have it all, but we need to do a much better job in integrating the technologies into our national by defense enterprise and of better integrating our collective national capabilities. And these, these do not happen naturally they require an environment that can effectively translate innovation into technologies, sound policies, financial incentives that create values to the American taxpayer, but also to the private sector. Yeah, it's a, it's a you know, long holistic view of the problem. Now, uh, it may, if I may, I'd like to just provide a very brief overview of what I consider to be um, the foundational capabilities and how tech can help. Uh, much has been said about surveillance and early detection. So I'll focus on what happens the day after, once we already have a serious epidemic and evolution. And it's fairly simple. We need to focus on test, trace, and isolation, caring for the sick, and protecting the healthy. So first, testing and tracing, which remain tried and true public health measures to address any infectious disease epidemic of a transmissible disease, any. Historically, the CDC has taken the role of developing and distributing diagnostic tests to public health labs at the outset of an epidemic, but COVID has exposed your shortcomings of this framework, which Scott Gottlieb and I alerted in our op-ed in the Wall Street Journal at the end of January. We knew that they wouldn't be able to keep up with the demand that this pandemic would pose. So 
it's time for us to actually have a rational national strategy that incorporates all available diagnostic technologies into the response. All diagnostic tests have a role to play and must be effectively deployed. We need to integrate the private sector by creating financial incentives, such as more permanent reimbursement schemes for EID tests, giving them material assistance to validate their tests, and ensuring, of course, a reliable supply chain of materials. Um, but we also need to support innovation akin to what has been done for drugs and vaccines over the years. The diagnostic tests have been a fairly neglected component of the countermeasures. And I have to say that there is no technological barrier that will prevent us from aiming very high. We all, we, the, the missing element is for a robust and healthy biodefense posture is to have true point of care tests that, that allows you to collect at the point of care and have a readout at the point of care with embedded information sharing to public health and clear communications to the individuals. Again, there's no technological barrier to achieving that, but we need to focus on that as a priority. Next, contact tracing is a term that is now familiar to most Americans. And, uh, but it has never been done at the speed or scale needed for a highly transmissible respiratory disease like COVID. Most states are failing miserably to execute it. Meeting this challenge will require a lot more than just manpower. We need technology. In the US, the federal government has remained completely silent on the issue. We can and must advance contact tracing technologies that protect privacy to comport with our values, but this is gonna require federal leadership to drive implementation. Not doing so is analogous to me to having every, asking every Uber driver to develop their own app to do their job. Uh, doesn't work in this day, day and age. So um, the next critical component I mentioned is caring for the sick. And of course, COVID show many facets of our healthcare system that is broken including the much worse clinical outcomes experienced by Black Americans. It's not a technological issue, it's a moral one, but one that must be addressed. Um, I also would say that the world really looked in shock as American healthcare workers pleaded for personal protective equipment to do their jobs safely. The distribution of PPE resources should be guided by best logistics technology. And to do that, we need supply data and demand data. Hospitals in the US should not have to fax bed availability information to FEMA in a crisis. So is it, you know, I hope the point here really is that there is cutting edge technology to be, to be advanced and invested in and harnessed, but there's also existing technology that must be incorporated into the backbone of our day-to-day -day business. Uh, next, I know it's the topic of great interest to the, to the commission, this issue of countermeasures development. And you know, at the onset of an epidemic, the first treatments to be tested are those that are usually already approved to be repurposed. Um, it's really interesting how this time around, we've been able to deploy some technology to support prioritization. Uh, and as a matter of fact, an artificial intelligence startup called Benevolent AI predicted that the arthritis drug, baricitinib, would be effective against COVID. And a randomized controlled trial conducted by the NIH confirmed that to be the case and gave us a readout on September 14th that showed that baricitinib when combined to remdesivir is superior to remdesivir alone in the treatment of COVID. This is the kind of technology that we need to be supporting more and validating more. On the other hand, it took us several months to learn this fact because we are doing trials by repurposing existing able but highly outdated infrastructure. To be clear, we are repurposing clinical trial networks that were created decades ago to study cancer, HIV, and flu. So we need to modernize our clinical trial infrastructure to provide definitive and timely answers. And the most efficient approach is to embed pragmatic randomized controlled trials within the healthcare system, leveraging our very large and sophisticated healthcare systems that have very large and sophisticated electronic health records. And this would be akin to what the UK is doing um, to study the, the, the medical countermeasures. And in this regard, I think that NIH and CMS should work together to build this capacity. 
Again, it's a new way of doing things, similar to contact tracing. You know, we are in the 21st century. We need to, to leverage technologies to be able to do it better and more efficiently. And lastly, we need to protect our healthy. And here we have two main tools, which are vaccines and physical distancing. At the onset of the epidemic, creating physical space between us is critical. But we know that the shutdown is a brute instrument. The public health gains are not sustained once it is reopened, but the social and economic impact are long lasting. We're still suffering from that. Technology can help tailor recommendations to the local environment. Slowing disease transmission while minimizing societal disruption. The CDC just yesterday published an early version of this concept for schools called Indicators for Dynamic School Decision Making, which makes use of epidemiological data to assess the risk of disease transmission in a school based on the area. This type of model should be expanded to all sectors so that we can take the appropriate public health measures for the local environment. And um, as far as vaccines, I think that uh, it's been a very successful story. There's a lot to be done still, but the clinical development is proceeding very fast. And I'll have to say that the credit really goes to the years of investments by agencies like DARPA and the DOD. A lot of the public health countermeasures that we deploy in an emergency have their origins in DOD. It's a little known fact. It's because it's a department that has been reluctant to embrace its fire, def fire defense responsibilities and to this day maintains separate programs for deliberate and naturally occurring bio threats. That's not how we harness the total collective capabilities that we have. So that should change going forward. In closing, COVID is not a one-off event. We need to focus on our core capabilities first before investing in the fifth generation MCM for deliberate threat. And I think they are inc incredibly important and deserve our focus. But at this time, it's time for us to really strengthen the foundational elements of biodefense. We need to commit to integrating technologies into the enterprise. It will not happen on its own and will require federal leadership dedicated to that. To attract the private sector, we'll need to have sound policies and new financial incentives beyond the bar as classic push incentives. CMS could have a very important role. It's been um, not very active in the enterprise. It's time for this to change. And you know, lastly, I would say that Congress has always approached the biodefense as a bipartisan issue, and we must continue to keep it that way. The work of this commission, as well as Representative Brooks and Aguette are exemplary in that regard. And Representative uh, Brooks' departure at the end of the term will leave a significant gap in Congress. And I sincerely hope that somebody steps in to help shepherd our nation to a more reliable and able by defense enterprise. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Borio, very much. That was uh, a very helpful testimony. I want to uh, just tell you in response to one thing you said that when I was asked to be uh, co-chair of this commission six years ago now, I really had in mind, I suppose because of my background working with Governor Ridge on Homeland Security, the threat of bioterrorism. But as our work on this went on, I was educated to see exactly what you said, which was that the larger threat, not that bioterrorism is not a threat, but the larger threat really was a naturally occurring biological event, an infectious disease pandemic. And of course, that's where we are now. Um, I wanna ask you and then ask Dr. Berger to comment on this. As you may know, uh, the commission uh, has been blessed recently with uh, two grants from foundations to um, initiate a study and produce a report on what we're calling an Apollo project to uh, so take the, the metaphor or the analogy to the um, uh, moonshot. Although it's not a one-time event, but we're focused particularly on uh, uh, the possibility of um, how, how do we create the conditions to create a uh, uni universal platforms for vaccines uh, uh, to counteract uh, viruses and uh, obviously influenza. 
Um, and I, you, you did touch on that, some, uh, Dr. Berger did as well. And I'm, I just wanted to ask both of you, uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Borio. Um, we're at, at the initial phase of this st uh, study. Um, what, what guidance would you give us uh, as to what direction in which we should go and, and really what we uh, might recommend? The, the basic idea is how do we better use science and technology research and development to, to be better prepared for the next pandemic? So, so I think that, you know, the, the lessons learned from this uh, pandemic on vaccines in particular are going to be very valuable to how we move forward. It's, it really has been a success story. It hasn't been as fast as we would like, but it has been a tremendous success story. We have a portfolio approach with vaccines that are relying on very different technologies right now. Um, excitingly, the, you know, the, the mRNA vaccines that are in, uh, at the, the fastest uh, you know, in clinical development are doing exactly what we had hoped they would do, right? Which is we can go from, from pathogen to vaccine design to clinic at, at a record, which we did. Um, the first time around is always tricky. I mean, they have to, it's not just the, va the vaccine candidate itself that we need to focus on these platforms, but how do we scale up manufacturing? How do we create flexible manufacturing um, uh, facilities? And again, I think it's wonderful that we are relying on uh, some of the companies are having their own uh, contracts, but we also rely on Emergent Biosolutions and uh, Texas AMU, which are an ology, the, 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 the government relationships with these ADMs, you know, both the DOD and HHS, to manufacture some of these vaccines. That's gonna be very important because you know, we, ha we haven't frankly made that much use of them before. We need to, um, we also, um, we're, the clinical development is proceeding as fast as possible. And keep in mind that the time it takes to really ascertain whether the vaccine is safe and effective is predicated on whether the vaccine is truly safe and effective, how safe and effective it is, and how much these activity is there in the background. So with a lot of cases in the background, a vaccine that is truly very safe and effective, we'll know very quickly. Uh, and, and then, of, of course, the, the, it's going to allow us to, to um, focus on the distribution systems and the pharm pharmacal vigilance. Those are technology-heavy uh, endeavors. The, uh, you know, we have to take a holistic approach. I think that there's been talk about using you know, immunization cards. That is 20, not 21st century uh, way to monitor people's uh, you know, vaccination status with little paper cards. It's just not the way we should be doing it. So uh, look, I think, I don't wanna overwhelm you, but I just want you know, th that we are doing, I think, really well with respect to uh, hard, leveraging the innovations that we have today based on these decades of investments. There's still a lot to be done going forward. Okay, that's really helpful. I must say <clears throat> it's refreshing uh, to hear you say that because you wouldn't know it uh, watching the media. And part of it is how partisan everything is. Part of it is the way in which the president approaches all this, which um, sort of raises expectations and then leads to cr counter criticism. But the reality is actually pretty good uh, uh, right now. So thanks for saying. Dr. Berger, do you want to add anything? I would actually, I would actually like to add sort of a few thoughts. Um, beyond the technical advantages or advancements that uh, Dr. Borio had mentioned, a few sort of societal, um, and I guess life science considerations should be consider taken into account. So for example, we in this pandemic and in every pandemic, when we see a new viral or bacterial strain causing disease, we need to do a lot of research to be able to understand and characterize that particular agent. We don't know necessarily what it's related to, whether it has certain genes or not uh, that might make it more or less harmful in, in humans, whether, you know, what animals it might be circulating in and so on and so forth. And a lot of those studies uh, in the past have leveraged a small group of experts who you know, have worked in fields related to those uh, viruses or bacteria. What we've seen with this pandemic is almost completely different. We've seen an onslaught of scientists throughout the world 
studying various aspects of the virus, of the sequences of uh, disease um, in people, disease in animals, uh, transmission, and it keeps going on. I think, you know, is it, I think uh, every day, hundreds to, to at least a thousand new papers are published on anything from peer reviewed journals to uh, pre-publication journals to just websites with information. And it raises a lot of question and concern about what do we really know? What can contribute to our knowledge base to create a vaccine that would be effective? What information gaps do we have? What would be the most effective approach going forward? And so a lot of the, the um, recognizing that we now live in a very different world in terms of communication and productivity and the scientific side, being able to think about how do you harness that onslaught of information to be able to get the information that you need. The other sort of piece of the, the puzzle that I want to comment on is, um, is something that I've been increasingly concerned about over the years, which is the increasing number of uh, general public who don't want to get vaccines, who don't trust the, the safety or efficacy of vaccines. Um, and that number continues to increase. And so the question is, if we want to have a vaccine strategy, we need to, to somehow think about how to approach this sizable population, potentially growing population, of people who are not uh, willing to, to get the vaccine for whatever reason. Uh, a lot of sort of clinical science has gone into that, but I would argue that a lot of social science, behavioral and organizational science also um, plays a major role and being able to harness the social sciences is something we don't do enough of. Thank you very much. Thank you both. We've, we've only got about 15 minutes left, so I want to yield to Governor Ridge for questions. Thank you. Uh, to follow on, uh, uh, Dr. Berge, the, uh, the interdisciplinary approach is, is very, obviously, it's greatly needed, but oftentimes when you're trying to change the paradigm, one of the most effective ways of doing it is illustrating a model where that approach has led to probably accelerated success in another area. Is there a model that you can think of uh, in recent uh, scientific history where we definitely took the life sciences, but as you pointed out, uh, there's a data analytics, there's a computer science, there's social science, where the problem that was identified was, uh, the solution to the problem identified result occurred because of the integration of the multiple scientific approaches that you refer to. Is there a model either in the private sector or within government that uh, we could look to that political figures who don't have, who are going to be at the epicenter of trying to solve, uh, create a better architecture to deal with the future pandemic, and we know that'll exist. Is there a model they can look to to say, yes, this interdisciplinary approach is something that we have to mandate, we have to incentivize, and we have to encourage. Is there a model out there? So Senator, uh, um, Governor Rich, I'll just, I'll just say that, um, you know, it's, it's not that it's the model that is, um, that is helpful, but it's the only model that will work for the remaining problems we have. Um, I, I, um, the date way. where we could achieve success by using just one discipline or acted in a silent way are long gone. I, I really feel pain for my kids, so I feel like I'm gonna have to really stretch their <laughs> intellect much more than I did. I could specialize in one area. You know, I think the future, it, it, I think we're seeing this um, in so many it, domains. And you know, an obvious one, I think it's the one that I raised with the baricitinib, the drug that was predicted using machine learning AI. Um, and you know, validated in the randomized controlled clinical studies. The t uh, I'll, I'll say too that um, even at the FDA, where I worked for so many years, all the review teams are multidisciplinary. Of course, we have a biological bench, a health bench, but the degree of subspecialization that occurs within those review teams to be able to achieve the appropriate regulatory approach for a different product is always very multidisciplinary. Uh, and I'll be happy to follow up with uh, the commission on more specific examples uh, of success stories. That'd be great. Kavita, would you mind uh, adding your thoughts on that as well, Dr. Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I, 
also uh, think that there's a lot of, um, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Borio in that, you know, we, we no longer can do research in simply life sciences or clinical sciences that we really do have to expand and leverage the capabilities across. I would say um, some sort of uh, limited successful models, although, you know, more uh, research needs to be done, is all of the work uh, integrating data science, the computational infrastructure, and, uh, and genomics, not only for uh, you know, human health, but also for uh, environmental health as well. A lot of the ecosystem programs, a lot of the agricultural, uh, precision agriculture programs, what they're doing is they're integrating a number of different data sources to help um, either better understand you know, what's in the environment or uh, what are the, the uh, effects of various different um, uh, soil or climate or water uh, stimuli. We see a lot of uh, effort and initiative and interest in precision medicine to help us inform um, individualized uh, clinical sort of approaches. We are now starting to see investments in um, looking at the whole population level, trying to leverage all of these different scientific sort of um, uh, scientific results and, and data that we are generating and have generated for a long time. And then in precision agriculture, it's really sort of using and leveraging the internet of things on a, on a farm, for example, um, to better understand what's the exact uh, right conditions for um, crop uh, development and so on. And so I, I think those are some really um, interesting and good examples to kind of start with where we have to know about data science and data engineering. We have to know about uh, computer science and algorithm development. We have to know about mathematics and, and um, statistics, and we have to know something about the biology itself. And increasingly, um, a lot of our transformative changes and, uh, and developments will be cross-disciplinary. The question is, how do we uh, promote those types of activities to really reap the benefits? I appreciate that. I must tell you, I was sitting here thinking about you and your colleague, uh, knowing that, I mean, we're so blessed to have the individuals such as yourself and Dr. Borio, who not only speak the language generically, but understand to much in much deeper detail the sophistication of the interdisciplinary approach because you live it and its impact. I have one more question for Dr. Borio, if you don't mind. At the basis, the foundation of the protocols that you laid out was testing. Then there was contact tracing. We're six months into COVID-19. Just as an average citizen out there wonders why, after six months, we still don't have, forget about universal testing, because we haven't quite figured out how to do that, have a test that we could say with confidence, maybe not fail safe, but could be accurate 95, 98% of the time. Maybe we do and I've missed it, but that's what I read. So is the complexity of the virus such that it has been difficult to come up with the appropriate tools to test? Is there hubris in our academic and our research community, not a problem, we could get to it and then suddenly they found a complexity in your mind, why has there been this delay? It's something that you and I'm sure just about every other panelist would say at the very beginning, at the outset, the most fundamental capability we must have today and going forward in the future is the testing component. What happened? And uh, how be delay in the future. So, you know, I'll, I'll acknowledge that we've never been faced with such a challenge. Even back in 2009, when we had the flu pandemic, we were able to rapidly augment capacity because we already had an existing backbone of flu diagnostic tests in the private sector. So, um, there are, we lack a national strategy and it hasn't been emphasized over the years. So, there are many of these tests can be, would be extraordinarily helpful if you know, they're fit for purpose. No test has to be perfect, they have to be fit for purpose. And they have to be deployed uh, in a way that maximizes their, their value. Uh, we were slow to integrate the private sector. They absolutely have to be part of our response bubble going forward. 
we need to have an understanding about what the supply chain uh, needs are. They need not they need material assistance with, so they can validate their test their protocols. Uh, it's very hard for a, a, a these these private developers to access the human specimens or the pathogen specimens early on to be able to do their validation so they can play a significant role. That can be engineered into the system going forward. They need assurances that they're going to be reimbursed fairly. Uh, and, and then we need a strategy about how is it that we're going to approach this. It goes back to the Gladiator movie story. This is how we tackle this issue. Um, and, in, and just lastly, I think there is really uh, an unmet need of the point of care tests that can give a rapid readout and all that. That is something that, you know, there was, it was not a technological barrier, but it's something that there was very little market incentive for us to have these tests day in, day out. They're beginning to emerge over the horizon. It's really exciting to see that these tests are now seeing the light of day. So it's a matter of time before we have them available, but we'll still need a coordinated strategy will still need to be able to main, main, you know, keep the private sector uh, engaged. Thank you. I want to thank you both for your contribution, not just today, but for the past many, many years, this, the broader issue of uh, health, safety, and security. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Jim Greenwood, Congressman Greenwood. <clears throat> um, first, for, uh, Dr. Berger, you <clears throat> talked about um, the problem of, of vaccine hesitancy and, and all of this, the, the sociological issues that um, uh, apply there too. Um, no matter how good the vaccines that we develop are, there will be some portion of uh, the American public who will just refuse to be vaccinated. Um, and, um, and many of them will, will, as a result of that, become sick and, and fill hospital beds and so forth. Um, will we Will we collect data? Is, 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 does HIPAA get in the way of us collecting data that shows that, um, that, 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 that individuals who, um, who don't get vaccinated, in fact, become infected and sick as a result of their refusal to, um, to be vaccinated? And, uh, and, and perhaps more draconian, um, is it the case that um, there should be some sort of a policy that allows insurers to say, if, you're, if you ref refuse to, to be vaccinated and you get sick and you, and you run up health care bills, hospital bills, that um, you don't have the same coverage that everyone should have, would have that, that, that do voluntarily become vaccinated. Um, <laughs> that's a very I, difficult question for me to answer in that question. <laughs> Actually, I might just punt to uh, to Dr. Borio. <laughs> well, I, I, I meant <laughs> to be provocative, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I do, I do think that there are a few things that we can think about, though. Um, and and I will I will defer to those questions to to Dr. Borio because she's a lot closer to those issues than I. Um, one of the things that we really need to do as a broader scientific community, and probably even sort of working closely with policymakers is to understand the, the general public, their concerns, their considerations, not only this sort of whole field of science communication, but also um, these fields uh, related to, um, you know, misinformation and countering misinformation, where the messages come from, what's resonating with different members of the public. Uh, the academies over the last several years, I've, I've come to learn in my, my two months there, um, is that they have done a lot uh, in terms of looking at misinformation issues and countering misinformation, a lot in science communication. Um, and I'm happy to share a whole bunch of programs and links with you, if that's of interest. Um, in addition, you know, Pew, a few years ago, uh, had talked about or had done a, a, a public survey uh, that demonstrated that, that the general public has really good sort of feelings towards technologies but not science. And, and that is something that we need to think about more critically because the scientific sort of underpinnings of those technologies is really important. It's critical. You can't have the technology if you don't know what's sort of underlying that. And, and to be able to really reach out and, and engage with the general public to understand the value of science, what it means, understand their hesitancy and their concerns and address those. Um, and then let, me, also, let me interrupt you. If I, sure. Will we have data 
eventually that says X number of folks who did not become, did not choose to be vaccinated. Will, will, will we have data that says how many people who were vaccinated became ill versus the number of people who, you know, anonymized, anonymized data, but data nonetheless. Um, I would imagine it would be public health data, but I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Borio to answer yeah. that question. I mean, I would imagine the ca that's the case because we do that for, for flu. We have a pretty good sense, especially for pediatric influenza. We know, uh, you know, the percentage of kids who uh, have worse outcomes and more vaccinated. You know, I think that it's, uh, you know, your, your questions are provocative, but I'll say that, you know, it's important to recognize that a vaccine is a tool. It's not the only tool. And it, you know, really decisions about being vaccinated, um, at, the, at the end of the day, they really, it matters whether the individual ha is the right person to be vaccinated. There are many reasons why an individual should not be vaccinated in, in general. And you know, I wish I could say that we have a vaccine that is 100% safe and effective, but that's not the case. So the idea that we make a compulsory program, uh, you know, vaccination on a tool that we know is gonna be imperfect. What we really ought to do is make sure that the, you know, the, there's confidence in the clinical development and approval authorization process with the knowns and unknowns, and that the public health recommendations about who should be vaccinated first are really sound and based on individual uh, risk factors and for, for, or, or compl for complication of disease or exposure. Um, you know, the vaccine, and I'll, I'll say this, I'm gonna have, I think that the randomized controlled clinical trials that are being done today for each vaccine for COVID. They are the gold standard, okay? And we will know very clearly whether these vaccines are safe and effective based on those randomized controlled trials. But we will not have data about rare adverse events, about long-term adverse events, about duration of immunity. We will not have sufficient data to license them because the manufacturing processes are still in development. So there's a lot of unknowns, and I think at this juncture, and I wasn't sure if your, if your comment was based on COVID vaccines or in general, but you know, there's so many unknowns that I don't think that we could even contemplate anything other than a voluntary program. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jim. I'm gonna give it to uh, Ken uh, uh, for the last round of questions. Governor Tom, I have to depart, so if it's okay, I'm gonna pass the baton uh, to you for the wrap up. And, uh, okay, but just be hey, well. Thank you. thank you. See you soon. Asha, it's been a great uh, uh, meeting, really. Very productive. Uh, Ken Weinstein Stein, it's all hey, yours. Hey, hey. Here you go. Ken, um, are you, you going to so, be the ambassador when Weinstein gets to go to Japan? Yeah. <laughs> we get each other's emails, actually. I Ken know. Weinstein take, and Ken Weinstein. Take so, care. All right, see ya. Um, so, I'm going to be very brief because I've got a two o'clock as well. But I, um, I want to thank you both for your very, um, very useful, very enlightening testimony. Um, but Dr. Borio, I just I, I've seen the Gladiator movie probably in total somewhere around a dozen times. Seems like every time I turn on the TV, I find it and I get riveted and I can't stop watching it. Um, and you, you, this is a great analogy. I loved hearing the the the, uh, or the reference twice. It's actually quite um, quite fitting in the sense that. One of the main themes that we've looked at is leadership and centralizing all the efforts of the government on the biodefense mission and how that should be done. And, um, and we think that we've thought since we put out our first report that that's not being done. And I think that's, um, we're seeing that very clearly in the, in the current pandemic, um, just sort of using the Russell Crowe uh, Maximus character. I mean, it, it, on the day after, as you said, um, who would be the gladiator? Who would be Maximus? And what would you recommend if we were to put together a structure that says, here is a on the shelf organizational structure for how to deal, how to respond to a pandemic? Yeah. Day one, day two. What would it's you a really recommend? important question. I know we struggle with this issue a lot actually during the development of the national biodefense strategy. Uh, I think that the Department of Health and Human Services has a primary responsibility because at the end of the day, it's a health issue. I think the right person is the person who is, um, who is not only intellectually able, of course, but has a temperament to coordinate the whole of government. Mm. You know, the goal is not to replicate all capabilities within one's um, department or agency or unit. It's to be able to harness all of the national capabilities 
across all the federal government, state, local, and the private sector. It's a big job, um, very challenging job. Uh, but I think that's the question that I would ask first. And then the decision really is whether you can successfully have that individual within HHS or it needs to be a White House uh, position. There are challenges of that, that approach as well, but I think you know, it needs to be discussed going forward given what we experienced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Good, no, I think you're right. It's a very live issue and um, we need to get it worked out before the next time we get hit with one of these pandemics. Okay, thanks to both of you. Governor? Listen, uh, thank you. Uh, Jim Goodwin, any follow-up questions? Tom, I, I do have one quick question yeah, if I could. Go ahead, go ahead Jim. Yeah, so Please. thank you. Um, Dr. Borio, you talked about um, uh, clinical trial reform and embedding um, clinical trials into the healthcare system. Could you just elaborate a little bit in the context of COVID, what you mean by that? Sure, so the only place to my knowledge that is doing that in the US is the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. They have a, a trial that is fully uh, embedded. Um, so, you know, remember that a long time ago we had um, the, well, to this day, clinical trials are a parallel effort. So somebody goes to the hospital or to the physician and then they look for opportunities for participation in clinical trial. There are many reasons for this, the, the, that uh, historical reasons, including the fact that there were uh, higher RIB issues that had to be decentralized. Nowadays, you know, the regulations are very clear about centralized RIBs. There's been a, um, I forget the name, but uh, medical centers have coalesced, right? Large medical centers, uh, which actually decreases competition in healthcare, but in a way it really allows us to then leverage this capability for, for clinical, for evidence generation. And we have EHRs. So over there in the UK and in the UPMC, when a patient um, shows up, the, the, they are able to uh, flag, the, the, there's a system that flags whether they would be eligible for a clinical study. And uh, there is a centralized uh, uh, a command center, if you will, that looks for, that does the consent remotely. And the randomization of which, uh, which treatment they may receive based on some of the unique features while well, the eligibility, eligibility to enroll is all automated within the system. Uh, the lab work that sometimes is required as part of a clinical trial is already ordered in a, you know, as part of the visit, the medical visit. So if the doctor is gonna check the cholesterol for that visit, but the lab research requirements are that we have more than just the cholesterol, the orders, the automa automatically include the clinical research orders. So it really is a highly integrated uh, clinical research apparatus within the delivery of healthcare. Uh, and the UK was able to you know, give us some significant answers very quickly uh, by doing this approach. It was argued here that we couldn't do that because we don't have a coordinated system like they do. But I would argue that we have the VA and Kaiser Permanente, PMC, Johns Hopkins, the UC system. We have very large uh, clinical centers that could uh, fulfill this role if there is a program to do that. And like I said, I think we'll need to work with the NIH and CMS to, to consider at least a pilot for these. Thank you, Dr. Borio. Listen, uh, let me on behalf of the panel thank, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, thank the panel. Uh, I must say we had some of the most provocative uh, testimony in a long time, what I found quite fascinating about it is that Asha, you were able to identify five experts so in very select areas of uh, expertise, but they were all integrated. I mean, if you, we're gonna look back on today and say, we're gonna take all this and it just kind of, it is, I think, reflective of the approach that the commission has tried to take. And we've talked about risk management. We've talked about interdisciplinary. We talked about central coordination. We talked about collaboration between the public and the private sector. And the panelists today have just corroborated and put an exclamation point on our approach. They've also contributed to a continuing process of the commission to learn more and adapt to and maybe mod modify some of the recommendations or expand the recommendations we want to make to the policymakers. So. On behalf of my colleagues in the Bipartisan Commission, I want to thank all of you who have participated. And as we 
as Senator Lieber mentioned before he left, this uh, new initiative within under the um, our umbrella is the Apollo Initiative. As we talk a little bit more about interdisciplinary action, don't be surprised if Asha's knocking on your door. Well, we don't knock on doors anymore. We got your email. We know where to find you uh, and your cell phone, and we know we can get you uh, through this wonderful form of communication. I, I tip my hat. We say thank you. Asha, for the board members that remain on the call, we will probably have, we may have some informal meetings. We tip my hat to you and the incredible group of uh, people you pulled across. Thank you. And final conversation, the panel members need to know this, Dr. Barrow, you and your colleagues. We don't want to look in the rear view mirror, but we sure wish that somebody would have paid a lot more attention to the, not to the recommendations we made five years ago. And maybe at times of crisis, maybe after this, and, and people were talking about a commission. Well, Pointing a finger of blame, we got to avoid that at all costs because it's not productive. And in a partisan political world we live in, it's inevitable. We can probably predict that'll happen. But I want you to know and your colleagues to know, and we're trying to let our friends on the Hill to know, both Republicans and Democrats, this bipartisan commission working with experts such as yourselves from around the country the past five years wants to contribute, wants to participate, wants to make a difference. You know this and every panelist knows this probably better than most members of Congress. COVID-19 is not a one-off event. It's a precursor to the globalization of disease for which we were not presently prepared. But when we have people such as yourself working day in and day out and others around this country working with policymakers and decision makers, maybe we can mitigate the dramatic personal and economic consequences of being totally unprepared for Mother Nature's wrath. So we thank you. I thank my colleagues. Any final words from my colleagues to Asha other than well done, Asha, again. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thanks all. Good night. Stay, well, stay safe. Be well. And thank Jim, you. great way. Congratulations. Grandsons are a joy, I know, from personal experience. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, panelists, for creating a world in which my grandson will be safe. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.